Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. I wasn't able to squeeze this particular story in the last video. It was a 20 part story, but now it has turned into a 25 part story. So I hope you all enjoy this story because I fell in love with it. So I want to share it with you. I am going to shut up now because I <laughs> talk a lot. Anyway, if you are new to the channel and you begin to love what you are hearing, please, we would love to have you as part of the family. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to on. That way you'll know every time I upload a video. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm. And prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled Halloween Finale. Skin, a 25-part story. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Part 1 Congratulations, Teresa. 172 pounds of weight loss is no small feat. Dr. Remini said, staring at the nervous young woman standing before him. She held her hospital gown tightly closed with her hands. Thank you, doctor. I'll feel a lot better once all of this loose skin is removed, she said softly. She could only see Dr. Remini's piercing blue eyes as his nose and mouth were covered by a blue mask. His dirty blonde hair was fully covered by a surgical cap. A slender nurse handed him a surgical skin marker, which he took politely from her hand. No worries, we're going to get you all fixed up so we can build up that confidence, okay? He said cheerfully. Teresa could hear the smile in his voice as he motioned her to step closer. She nervously stepped forward as he opened her gown. He spoke to the female nurse as he drew dotted circles and lines all over her body where he would remove the loose skin. A lot of satisfaction and excitement entered his eyes as they prepared for the surgery. Are you ready, rookie? Detective Addison asked the new, young, and clearly nervous partner, Detective Ramirez. His credentials were impressive as he had worked his way up quickly and made detective at just 25. He was a handsome young man of Hispanic ethnicity. His golden brown skin complemented his walnut brown hair and large light brown eyes that were shaded by thick long eyelashes. His build was muscular on his 5'11 frame. And when he spoke and smiled, dimples appeared on both cheeks on both sides. He looked every bit of 17 or 18 years in age, even in his light blue button-down and slacks. Detective Addison wouldn't have taken him seriously if he hadn't read his impressive resume for himself. The two walked cautiously down a steep hill that led to Cypress Lake. The whole area was busy with police, ambulances, and crime scene technicians. As they carefully reached the bottom of the hill, the sound of flies buzzing was louder than the chatter. They approached a large crouching man with his blonde hair and a low ponytail, crouching over a body that had been covered in a tarp. What do we have here, Phil? Detective Addison asked, waving his hand to clear away some of the flies buzzing around his face. This is wild. Phil said, lifting the black tarp. Immediately, Detective Ramirez felt ill. Under the tarp was a completely skinless corpse. Everything was missing, even the hair and eyelids. Just empty, dilated eyeballs staring into nothing, covered by nothing, just muscle exposed. Detective Ramirez's face turned pale. Hey, kid. Don't fuck up the crime scene. If you're going to puke, do it somewhere else. Detective Addison griped. No, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Detective Ramirez said, taking deep breaths while waving away flies. I'll go talk to Lena. She responded to the call. 
Detective Addison said, staring at a busty brunette uniformed cop that stood a bit away in the distance. So you're the new partner, huh? Phil asked, covering back up the corpse. He stood up and scribbled something down in a notepad with his gloved hands. Yeah, hi, I'm Joseph Ramirez, sir, he said, politely trying hard not to look nervous. Nice to meet you. I'm Phil. Hey, don't let Carlson get to you. He's just as bothered by this shit as anyone else. He's just good at pretending he's not. He motioned to where Detective Addison was walking towards Lena. Watch closely. Whenever he's nervous or sick, he pulls out a cigarette. He only smokes when shit gets to him, Phil said reassuringly. Sure enough, Detective Addison pulled a pack of smokes out of his right pants pocket and lit one up. He took a long drag before blowing smoke from his nose and mouth. Seeing this surprisingly made Joseph feel better. Detective Addison from the beginning seemed like a rock, almost robotic in his operations. He stood at an intimidating six foot three. He was a slumber build with defined muscle tone. He was 37 but looked a bit older with his full goatee. His auburn hair had a natural wave to it and was combed back neatly. A small but deep scar sat at the end of his eyebrow giving him a slightly menacing look. His voice was deep and monotone most of the time. His skin was slightly tanned and a few barely noticeable freckles adorned the top of his nose. He always wore dark slacks, white button-downs with various plain-colored ties that were always loose and stylish jackets. He apparently had solved a lot of murder cases and was regarded as one of the best, especially for his age. Being partnered with him made Joseph incredibly nervous, however, seeing that he was affected by the skinless corpse as well as humanized him a bit. See there? Told you, Phil said kindly, his brown eyes glistening in the sun. He motioned for two other technicians to join him. Joseph thanked him and made his way over to Detective Addison, who had finished his chat with Officer Lena. The cigarette hung from his mouth. He put it out and placed the half that was left back in his back. Let's get started, kid, he said. Yes, sir, Joseph replied. The process of witness interviews, evidence collection, and attempted scene reconstruction took hours. It was obvious that the body had been dumped at this particular location in the night and later found by a couple of early morning joggers. The victim was male, but nothing else was known. It had rained the night before, so a lot of evidence was unfortunately washed away. No cameras were around either, as the area was just land, trees, a sidewalk, and the lake. All the businesses were a distance away. Still, they asked around if anyone had seen anything suspicious. Did anyone have cameras facing the lake? The morning soon turned into late evening by the time they made it to Phil's lab with questions on what he had found in his examination so far. Upon entering the cold lab, Joseph noticed that Phil's kind demeanor had been replaced with a much more solemn one. The skinless corpse lay on an examination table. Phil tapped on a tablet before looking up, noticing them walk in. He quickly covered the body while looking at Joseph. Before they could ask anything, Phil spoke up. Hey, fellas, I found some info for you, he said seriously. They both pulled out their notepads and listened carefully. The victim is a young male, estimated age early to mid-twenties, six feet. He has dental implants. It will be at least 48 hours before we can get an ID with that. From what I can see, whoever did this is a professional. The skin was removed with surgical precision, including the subcutaneous tissue and fascia. There are no knife marks on the muscle. 
So to do that, one would have to use a surgical tool like a scalpel, right? Joseph asked. Yes, that amongst other things, such as surgical scissors, Phil replied. Joseph and Detective Addison wrote the information down in detail. Possible suspects, medical professionals, possible and likely weapon, scalpel, and surgical scissors. There's something else, Phil said, with a concerned look on his face. They both looked at him. Rocuronium was found in his system. Rocuronium is a paralytic agent, usually given alongside a sedative during surgical procedures. However, only Rocuronium was found in his system. Meaning, Detective Addison asked, furring his eyebrows. Meaning he was aware but unable to move when he was skinned. Joseph and Detective Addison just looked at each other. Part 2 So you're saying he was skinned alive? Detective Addison asked, Phil with a disgusted look on his face. Yes, it seems that way. The victim died of cardiac arrest, Phil said, looking towards the covered skinless corpse. Anything else? asked Detective Addison. That's it for now. I'll call you once I'm done with my examination. Joseph and Detective Addison thanked Phil and left the lab, feeling disturbed by what they had learned. They traveled back to the precinct in mostly silence, only discussing the mountain of paperwork they needed to start the next day. Carly sat staring at her third whiskey on the rocks, swiping tears from her cheeks. She had driven over an hour away from her husband's office in their neighborhood to a questionable part of town after catching him with his assistant. So typical, she thought to herself. She entered a raggedy, dimly lit bar where all the patrons overlooked high on something or shifty. She didn't care. She just wanted to drink. The small two-person table she chose at the back of the bar vibrated as she looked down at her phone. It was Daryl, her piece-of-shit husband. She let out a little laugh before swiping ignore. She took a swig of her drink and laid her head in her hands, eyes closed, tears flowing. A soft tap on the shoulder made her jump. A tall, attractive man with dirty blonde hair and piercing blue eyes, wearing a stylish black ensemble, stood to her right side holding a Kleenex in his hand. He handed it to her. She accepted it, looking ashamed, her cheeks and nose flushed. Thank you, Carly said, drying her eyes and face. She downed the rest of her drink. The attractive man sat down at another small table to her left. There's only one reason why a beautiful woman comes to a dump like this at midnight alone, the man said, crossing his long legs. Yeah? What's that? Carly responded back sarcastically. Guy problems. Let me guess. You found him cheating. The man said seriously. <laughs> wow, um, that's impressive. Carly said, looking down at her empty glass. Six years, Mr. Stranger. I gave him six years, and this is what he does. She started laughing and crying. I've been betrayed, too. I know how it screws you up. How it can eat away at you. You can't let it, the man said to Carly. Hey, why are you talking to me? <laughs> Do I know you? Carly asked, staring in the man's piercing blue eyes. No, I was just admiring you from the other side when I realized you were crying and decided to come and speak to you. I hope you don't mind. A lot of creeps in here might take advantage of a vulnerable, attractive young woman, especially in a place like this, he said woefully. Well, thanks. Carly responded with a half-hearted smile. You know, why don't you tell me about it? We won't see each other after tonight anyway, so it won't matter, and 
you'll feel a little bit better, the man said, making his way to Carly's table. She didn't object. Perhaps it was the alcohol or the shock of seeing her husband and someone else, but she opened up to the tall, attractive stranger, telling him a brief overview of her life with her husband, their issues and his infidelity. He was engaged the entire time, hanging on each word as if he would be tested on them later. His eyes took an intense glare when she finished her tale of betrayal. You know, it sounds like he never appreciated you, Carly. You've done a lot for him. Moved states for his career and everything, the man said seriously. I know, I know I deserve better. I, I just want to hurt him the way he's hurt me. I know that's horrible to say, but that's how I feel, she said angrily. The man grabbed her hand softly. Carly looked at him with furrowed brows. Why don't we go somewhere? He asked softly. Uh, I don't know. I've never done anything like that before, she said, removing her hand from his. Just one night. One night to forget him. One night where it's all about you, Carly, the man said seductively. He looked her in the eyes and they held the gaze for a while before she shook her head yes. His car was nice and spacious, black, leather-seated, and modern. A air freshener that made the car smell fresh and clean was clipped to the air vents. He drove carefully, stealing glances at Carly occasionally, reassuring her with smiles that what they were doing wasn't wrong. They made it to a small house tucked away behind some trees. Other houses, lights could be seen shining through the trees. He opened the car door for her and walked up to his house and invited her in. The inside was what one would expect the bachelor's home to be. The living room consisted of a dark gray sectional, a glass coffee table, a large flat screen television, an artistic bookshelf, and some abstract art on the walls. The man didn't waste any time kissing Carly on the neck. She was stiff as no man had touched her in six years, other than her husband. She suddenly remembered the sound she heard coming from her husband's office when she stopped by to surprise him with dinner. The pit in her stomach as she slow walked to his door, knowing what she would find behind it. She spun around and found the man's mouth with a roan. The kiss was deep and passionate. The man guided her towards his bedroom door. There, he pulled away from her and looked her up and down. She wore a simple white A-frame dress with red flowers all over it. Her auburn hair laid on her shoulders. She stared up at him in confusion with her dark blue eyes. He turned her around and stood behind her. She was facing a full-length floor mirror. The man unzipped her dress and slowly lowered it. Never breaking eye contact with her, through the mirror, she stood in her matching black bra and panties, staring back at the man. He rubbed his hand down her back and then her arms. You're exquisite. He said softly, rubbing his hands down her sides. His mouth found her neck as he gently pulled her backwards so her head could rest on his chest. She closed her eyes, enjoying the tingly sensation of his tongue when she suddenly felt a sharp prick in her neck. Her eyes shot open as the man pushed a syringe in the right side of her neck. Carly tried to pull away, but he held her tightly with his left arm across her chest. Everything happened quickly, and before she could even scream, he had thrown the empty syringe down and placed his hands over her mouth. Her neck burned, and so did her veins. It felt like fire was moving through her body. She jerked trying to fight it, but realized quickly her body felt heavy. The man never broke eye contact with her through the mirror. A stone-cold look was on his face the entire time as she struggled. Within a minute, she could no longer feel her own body. She went limp in his arms. She couldn't scream or speak. All she could do was cry. 
She found it hard to breathe as he lifted her effortlessly onto his bed. Carly woke up realizing she must have blacked out. She tried to move but couldn't. She was locked in her own body. Her eyes were closed and she could hear the sound of clinking metal and ruffling plastic. The man lifted her left eyelid. His face was covered with a surgical mask and his head a surgical cap. It's almost time to get started, Carly. Sorry you have to be awake for this, but it's better for the skin if it has continuous blood flow for as long as possible. No worries, though. I work quickly. All your troubles will be over soon, he said, letting go of her eyelid. Tears rolled from Carly's eyes as she listened to the man humming. She thought of her husband as she felt the first slice of her skin. Part 3 Phil called. Let's roll, rookie, Detective Addison said to Joseph, lifting his jacket from the back of his desk chair. Joseph quickly saved his computer file and shut the computer off. He followed Detective Addison out of the precinct, still thinking about the investigation. They didn't have much to go on so far. No identity of the victim and no possible leads for suspects other than being a possible healthcare worker skilled in surgery at this point. That wasn't much to go on. Joseph hoped that Phil could give some more answers. The morning sky was filled with gray clouds and a cool breeze in the air. For a regular Tuesday, there was a surprising amount of traffic that caused Detective Addison to cuss in irritation as they drove to the lab. By the time they entered Phil's lab, rain had started pouring heavily, giving a hazy look to the world around them. Welcome back, fellas, Phil said, picking up his tablet from a metal table. What else did you find out? Joseph asked eagerly. We have an ID on your victim, 24-year-old Jackson Lawson, Phil said, handing Detective Addison the tablet. On the tablet was the picture of a young, attractive white male, black hair, gray eyes, pierced ears, and a happy smile. Looking at the picture filled Joseph with a sadness and more determination. Detective Addison handed the tablet back to Phil, who set it down on the metal table. I've already sent the file over. Phil said seriously. Anything else? Detective Addison asked, frowning. Uh, yes, I believe he was murdered sometime between Sunday morning or early Saturday evening. His body was also kept cold before being dumped by the river Sunday. That's why there wasn't much decomposition, Phil said, crossing his arms. Detective Addison and Joseph took more detailed notes. All right, thanks, Phil. Detective Addison said, tucking his notepad into his left pants pocket. Yeah, no problem. I hope you nail whoever did this, Phil replied, narrowing his eyes. Great, we have an ID finally. Now, I feel like we can actually start investigating this case, Joseph said, as they walked towards the exit. We have a lot to do, rookie. Let's get started. Detective Addison replied as they both hurried through the rain into the car. Shit, it's raining. The four teens yelled as they took cover under the highway bridge. They had collectively decided to skip school again. They laughed loudly, pushing one another and joking. Once the rain stopped, they would go to their usual hangout spot in the wooded area next to the highway, where they spent many days doing things they should not be doing. What's that smell? One of the young girls asked, holding her hand over her nose. Her friend also held her nose and furled her brows. Yeah, what the fuck is that? It smells like a dead cat, her boyfriend exclaimed. They walked casually further and under the bridge and all stopped dead in their tracks. Halfway under a ripped black trash bag was a completely skinned and rotted body covered in maggots and flies. The young girl and one of the young boys let out loud screams while the other the young boy vomited. Part 4 
Jason Lawson, 24, worked as a model for Jewel Modeling Agency for the last four years. He was also enrolled in online part-time college courses at TSU for general education, Joseph said, updating the digital crime board. Okay, he lived with his sister and brother-in-law in Ashton. His sister and brother-in-law left Friday morning for a family reunion up north. She said she spoke to Jackson Friday night, but didn't hear anything else from him. Her and her husband got back late Monday night and assumed he was out with friends, Detective Addison added. I spoke to his friend Caleb Wright at the agency. Apparently, Jackson was in contact with multiple plastic surgeons in hopes to get a leg scar removed, Joseph said, staring at Detective Addison. Did he give any names? Detective Addison asked, sitting up in his chair. No, but Jackson was supposed to meet a surgeon for a consult on Saturday morning who specialized in excisions. Mr. Wright said that Jackson met the guy online and he was the most reasonably priced, Joseph said. A surgeon doing a consult on a Saturday? Uh, that's suspicious, Detective Addison said, tapping his pen on his desk. According to Mr. Wright Jackson, said the surgeon has a private practice. We have computer forensics going through Mr. Lawson's computer messages now, Joseph said, taking a seat. No point in getting comfortable, fellas. You have another stiff, Captain Finnegan said, with a serious look on his face. Captain Finnegan was a six-foot, fair-skinned, middle-aged man with a lightly beer gut, dark red hair and blue eyes. He had a plump face that gave him a more youthful appearance. He looked unimposing, but was skilled in multiple martial arts and disciplines, and held one of the highest firearm shooting scores in the department's history. He had a calming voice and demeanor, but meant business and ran his precinct like a weld-oiled machine. Detective Addison and Joseph received the information from Captain Finnegan, another skinned body found by some teenagers skipping school. They looked at each other before heading out. The scene was all too familiar as Joseph and Detective Addison made their way under the highway bridge. The difference this time was the putrid stench that attacked their senses as they drew closer to the crouching Phil. Joseph was close to gagging by the time they reached the rotting, skinless corpse. Phil stood up when he heard them approach. He was wearing a thick face mask that he pulled down a bit with his gloved hand. Hey, so obviously, this victim has been here a while, another male, serious decomposition. He was definitely killed a few days before our last victim. Same style from what I can see, surgical precision, no obvious wounds on the remaining muscle, Phil said. Struggling not to vomit, Joseph took deep breaths and wrote the information down. Detective Addison reached in his pocket and found his pack of cigarettes. I wonder why this victim was dumped in a more secluded area. While Mr. Lawson was dumped in the open, Detective Addison asked out loud, I can't answer that, but I can say that this victim was placed in a bag before being dumped. They're going to see if they can lift some fingerprints from it, Phil said, pulling back up his mask and crouching back down over the body. Joseph quickly walked away, and so did Detective Addison, who lit a cigarette and took a long pull, holding the smoke in for a while before blowing it out. He closed his eyes and leaned his head back, breathing in and out. I think they became more confident, Joseph said quietly. What's that, rookie? Detective Addison asked, turning his attention to Joseph. You ask why did the suspect place the second victim out in the open? I think they became more confident. Maybe this victim was their first? That's why the secluded dumping space and bag... I don't know, just a thought, Joseph said, looking at Detective Addison. It's a solid thought, kid. Definitely a possibility, Detective Addison said, taking another pull from a cigarette. Whatever their reason, 
I don't think they're finished, Detective Addison said, very solemnly. Part 5 Happy Wednesday, fellas. Simon Hand, 29, likely murdered sometime last Monday morning and kept cold until being dumped on Tuesday, Phil said, pushing the rotted, skinless corpse inside a mortuary cabinet. You got an ID fast, Detective Addison said, looking surprised. Yeah, his DNA was already in the system. He was accused of assault 10 years ago, but his sample didn't match what was on the victim, so he was never convicted. His info remained in the system, though, Phil explained, crossing his arms. We're looking at the same killer, right? Joseph asked. I believe so. It definitely fits the same M.O. Recurium was also found in his system, but at a much higher dose than Mr. Lawson. Mr. Hahn died from respiratory failure, probably before the suspect was finished. Same surgical precision in removing the skin, leaving no cuts on the muscle, Phil said, looking towards the morgue freezer. Suddenly, all of their phones pinged. Detective Addison and Joseph pulled their phones from their pockets, and Phil lifted his from the metal table. After looking at their phones, they all went pale as they received information and directions to a location where another body was found. This one behind some office buildings. They all made it to the crime scene together, which was busier and louder than the two before. This time, news crews were there as uniformed cops taped off the crime scene and blocked any unwanted spectators. One of Phil's assistants was already collecting evidence near the body. Laying on the pavement in front of a back entrance was a skinless female body, her cloudy eyes staring into nothingness. In the middle of her skinless chest, a gold wedding ring was placed there. Joseph didn't feel as sick as before. He hated the thought that he might be getting used to seeing such horrific sights. As he felt anger and frustration, pictures were snapped of the body and surrounding area before Phil gloved up and gently placed the ring in an evidence bag, handing it to his assistant. The body is still frozen. Phil said, using two fingers to gently press the body. She was just dumped, Detective Addison said, scanning the area for any potential cameras. Joseph stood quietly and thought, staring at the body before speaking. She's the third victim. We're dealing with a serial killer, Joseph said, looking sternly. The tall, handsome man walked past the bustling college campus unnoticed blending in with the herd of busy students and professors. His baseball cap pulled low on his head, shading his piercing blue eyes. He wore a hoodie with the school's name on it and a notebook placed strategically in his hand that he lifted to cover most of his face whenever anyone got too close. He wanted to see her again, the beautiful chocolate-skinned girl he had spotted a few days ago. His eyes lit up as she walked out of the building, her long, dark coils bouncing as she walked confidently. Her skin was perfect from what he could see of it, smooth and blemish-free. He whispered to himself, You're exquisite, before smiling. Part 6 We're on our third murder here, people. All within days of one another. The media is all over this shit now. Those fucking teens live streamed some information and now they're doing an interview with that busy body reporter, Roberta Asher from Channel 7 News. The deputy chief has been up my ass the last few days about this. Tell me you have something. Captain Finnegan yelled angrily at the room. Filled with detectives and uniformed cops, his gaze a special on Detective Addison and Joseph. Detective Addison gave Joseph an approving nod as he stood up nervously and approached the digital crime board. Joseph faced the board of his fellow officers as Captain Finnegan crossed his arms. Um, uh, 
We believe the first victim, Simon Hand, 29, was murdered sometime last Monday. He worked as a freelance computer technician. According to his fiance, he was contacted online for a job early Monday morning and never returned. She reported him missing when she couldn't contact him and he didn't return home. The second victim, Jackson Lawson, 24, possibly murdered sometime late Saturday evening. He left early that Saturday for a consultation with a plastic surgeon. The latest victim, Carly Dickerson, 27, unlike the other two victims who met the possible suspect online. Her husband said Carly ran off after catching him with his secretary. We believe she was murdered sometime between Sunday night or Monday morning. She was kept frozen for some time before being dumped behind her husband's office building Wednesday morning. Her car was found at Leo's Bar downtown. We've had computer forensics go through Mr. Hahn and Mr. Lawson's computer messages. However, the suspect was using some kind of encryption device. We weren't able to pinpoint a location. Joseph said, finally taking a deep breath. The husband? Asked Dr. Finnegan. His alibi checks out. He's also not in the medical field, but in a corporate executive for the rain company. Joseph said, thinking back on the complete mess Mr. Dickinson was in during questioning. He thought how he clearly blames himself for what happened to his wife. What about the bar? Any information from there? Captain Finnegan asked, looking intimidating. Yes, the bartender said Mr. Dickinson left a little after midnight with a tall white male with dark blonde hair. He couldn't see his face. He said they left through the back entrance. Joseph said, looking towards Detective Addison, who stood up to take over. Joseph stared at the three photos on the digital crime board as Detective Addison made his way beside it. Simon Han, Jackson Lawson, Carly Dickerson. What is the connection? Jamie thought to himself. Each victim was found with a muscle relaxant rocrionium in their system. Each victim was skinned alive with surgical precision. We believe that the suspect is someone in the medical field, a surgeon or someone with surgical expertise. We know that he knows this city well, as he picked up each victim from places with no cameras and where there aren't many witnesses. He did the same when dumping the victims. The parking lot camera from the rain company was apparently destroyed the day before Mrs. Dickerson was dumped. We believe this could have been planned by the suspect, Detective Addison said, making contact with Captain Finnegan. Do we have a motive? Captain Finnegan asked, narrowing his eyes as he looked at the crime board. We're still working on it, Detective Addison responded. We have to get in front of this. Get me a suspect and get to work, Captain Finnegan demanded, walking frustrated back to his office. Detective Addison returned to his desk, feeling frustrated as well, and turned his attention to his young partner, whose eyes never left the three photos of the victims. Each photo showed a young, attractive individual. Shit, rookie. Rookie? Detective Addison said, looking at Joseph. Their skin is beautiful, Joseph said quietly. What's that, rookie? Detective Addison asked. They're all young, attractive, smooth, and blemish-free, Joseph said, getting up and pointing to the photos. Okay, keep going, Detective Addison said, following. Simon Han, attractive, smooth skin. Jackson Lawson, worked as a model, and Mrs. Dawson's husband said she did some modeling for a few years in her late teens and early 20s. He picked these particular people because of their flawless skin, Joseph said, looking at Detective Addison. Good job, rookie. You've just found the motive. Now we just need the freak doing this shit, Detective Addison replied. Part 7 He needed to be more careful now. His work was all over the news and social media. He couldn't help but feel proud. The police had no real leads. Just like his work, he was detailed, oriented, in everything he did. 
He made sure to leave no evidence, no hair samples, no fingerprints, nothing. He even chose his last two victims carefully, watching them, learning about them before engaging them. His needs weren't fulfilled quite yet. He watched the beautiful chocolate-skinned girl enter her midnight blue car from her apartment. He had been watching her for hours today, and today she was even more radiant than before with her tightly coiled hair lying freely on her shoulders and back. She wore a loose off-shoulder pink top that showed her delicate skin and white shorts that displayed the perfection of her legs. A shiny silver ankle bracelet moved as she walked with a bounce, holding her large white purse over her shoulder. He followed behind her as she drove, always staying one to two cars behind to not alarm her. He didn't know where she was headed, but wherever it was, he hoped it was a good and private place for them to finally meet. Brianna's phone rang and she answered through the radio's Bluetooth speaker. It was her roommate Jasmine, smacking loudly and annoyingly on food on the other end. Bree Bree, I just got home and my mama made her famous hot wings. What are you doing? She said, chewing loudly. Jay, oh my God, girl. I told you not to talk to me with all that damn smacking. You know I have misophonia, Brianna reported. Oh, damn, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry I keep forgetting Jasmine said, apologetically swallowing her food. Uh, it's fine. Did you forget I'm going to a bar tonight for my non-participant observation study for my sociology course, Brianna replied. Oh yeah, that's tonight. Girl, be careful. You should have waited to take me with you, Jasmine said, sounding concerned. It's kind of something I have to do on my own. I'll, I'll be careful, though. Besides, the assignment is due soon, and I can't wait for you to come back from your visit home. Don't worry, I'll call you when I'm on the way back to the apartment. You be careful out there too, Jay, Brianna said, making a crisp right turn. Okay, I will. My mama says, hey, I love you, Jay said cheerfully. Tell your mom I said hey, and I love her too, Brianna replied, smiling and disconnected the call. She drove another 10 minutes before pulling up to the Los Hermanos Mexicanos Bar, a medium-sized bar with a large covered patio area. It was a perfect place for people watching as it was busy on Friday nights and the outside area had some similar tables that would make it easier for her to sit, observe, and take detailed notes. Her objective was simple, study how people socialize in a social setting and how people interacted with one another, the staff and vice versa. She hoped to have enough notes for her report after an hour. She parked her car and made her way into the bar with her large bag that contained her notebook and pens inside. The bar was dim and loud with people, laughing and talking over one another. A couple of large flat-screen TVs adorned a few walls with different soccer games, showing... The smell of food, spices, and liquor filled her nose as soon as she walked further into the bar. She pushed past some of the patrons to get to the covered outside patio area. The night air was refreshing. Fairy lights added a beautiful ambience to the patio, but the area was still lacking sufficient lighting. She was suddenly grateful for her decent eyesight. It was a few less people in the patio area, but still crowded. She scanned the area and spotted a square wooden table by the guardrails. She quickly made her way to the table and took a seat with her back to the guardrails and pulled out her notebook. She set her purse on the table to hide what she was doing, though no one seemed to pay her any attention except for a few guys who were smiling at her. She started her observation right away, noting the location, atmosphere, size, and layout of the bar, and some of the drunken behaviors she was witnessing. She was 30 minutes into writing when she heard a light tap on her table that made her look up. Standing there looking at her 
with a polite smile was a tall, handsome man with piercing blue eyes and dirty blonde hair that peeked out from under a baseball cap. He wore a stylish black outfit, black boots, and carried a notebook with a pen stuck in his hand. Excuse me, there isn't any other seating. Is it okay if I sit here for a bit? The man asked politely. Um, well, I'm kind of in the middle of a school assignment. I usually wouldn't mind. It's just that I can't have any interactions. Brianna explained nervously. Oh, no way. Are you here doing an observational study too? The man asked in a whisper. Yeah, yeah, I am. You too? Brianna asked, smiling. Yeah, I'm doing a non-participant observational study for psychology. I'm writing a paper on the impact of alcohol within social groups, the man said, sitting down. That's awesome. I'm also doing a non-participant observational study, but it's for sociology, Brianna replied, smiling. Brianna noticed that the man looked to be in his mid-thirties and a lot of older students went to university to get their graduate or even undergrad degrees. There were students in some of her classes that were already grandparents. She respected it. If I sit here and observe quietly, can I stay? The man asked sheepishly. I mean, you're already sitting, Brianna said jokingly. Wonderful. The man said, smiling at Brianna. He looked at her silky, shiny skin. Wonderful, he repeated. Part 8 Brianna had finished her notes half an hour ago, but remained quiet and seated as to not disturb the handsome man. It had started to storm, and she was growing ever irritated as the temperature was dropping. It was raining a lot lately as the weather was shifting. She watched the man take notes, his gaze intense, his hand steady. His handwriting was small and perfect, neatly computer-like. He separated his notes into columns by perfect lines he made by hand, something she could never do without a ruler. She pretended not to notice that he snuck in the occasional look to her from time to time with a flirtatious smile on his face. She didn't know him, and she didn't need any distractions in her life. The man closed the notebook and placed his pen back in it. He turned his direction to Brianna with a smile. I think that will do, he said, looking at her intensely. I'll say, your notes put my notes to shame. Brianna said, shaking her head. Eh, I wouldn't worry about that, the man replied with a little laugh. Brianna placed her notebook in her purse and decided to stand when the man placed his hand in front of her. Hey, um, since we're here, how about a drink, he said politely. Oh, I drove tonight, so I can't, she replied. Oh, it doesn't have to be alcoholic. Before she could refuse, he motioned for a waiter that was walking by and asked for a drink menu. The man kept his head down as he opened the small drink menu, turning to a back page that read, Mocktails. He ordered a Roy Rogers and asked Brianna what she wanted. Uh, I'll take a Sprite, please, she said politely. Okay, will this be together or separate? The waiter asked politely. Separate. Brianna interjected before the man could speak. The waiter took the small menu back and walked away. It took five minutes for him to come back with their order. A small tabletop kiosk lit up where they could both pay separately without needing to bother the staff directly. Brianna paid for her drink and sipped on it slowly. I wanted it to be my treat, the man said, sounding disappointed. Oh, that's okay. I'll treat myself, Brianna said, sipping her drink. The man sipping his drink through a straw gracefully. So, are you a sociology major? He asked, leaning back in his chair. Psychology, actually. And you? Brianna replied. Medical, but right now I'm taking online courses, he said, smiling proudly. 
Loud thunder cracked, making Brianna jump as lightning lit up the sky. The patrons seemed unbothered by the weather as they continued their drunken laughing and talking. The music grew a bit louder, and the bar seemed to pick up even more as the night went on. Brianna, halfway finished with her drink and felt chilled, she was ready to leave. Um, hey, it was nice to meet you, but it's getting late. I'm cold and ready to leave. My name is Brianna Moore. You can find and email me through the NSU student directory. Maybe we can do a study group or something together, Brianna said, preparing to stand up. The man was irritated. Brianna was difficult. His charms and looks were usually enough, but she remained aloof. He quickly stood up, grabbing his notebook, roughly knocking over Brianna's drink onto her lap. Brianna let out a loud gasp, standing up, knocking ice cubes from her lap. The sound got a few patrons' attention. He quickly turned his back to them so they couldn't see his face. They quickly returned to their own social activities within moments, to the man's relief. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, Brianna he exclaimed, grabbing napkins from the table to assist her in drying herself. It, it's fine, it's fine. It was an accident, she said, sounding irritated as soda dripped from her legs. Um, let me at least pay for your clothes to be clean, please, the man said in a dispirited tone, his face racked with guilt. It's just soda, nothing a little laundry detergent can't fix. It's not a big deal. She replied in a calmer voice on inspection of his guilty face. I'm going to head for the bathroom for a bit, Brianna said, walking by the man. Oh, okay, he said, smiling. The bathroom was surprisingly clean but crowded as Brianna entered. It had six walls and six sinks. All of the stalls were full, and she could hear the sound of someone vomiting in one of them. She took some thick paper towels, wet them with a bit of hand soap and water, and washed the stickiness from her legs. She dabbed her shorts a bit in warm water and stared at herself in the mirror. The man was very attractive, though older than her usual type. It was clear he was flirting with her, but she had made a promise to her parents when going to university out of the state that she would stay focused on her studies. She was just 21 and would graduate at the end of the next year if she continued doing well. There would be plenty of time for romance. Stay focused, she reminded herself before exiting the bathroom. Brianna made her way back to the outside area but stopped at the door. The man was gone from the table. Only a folded piece of notebook paper remained. She walked over and grabbed it, reading it. I'm really sorry. It read. She smiled before folding it and placing it in her large purse. The rain was heavy and the thunder intense. Luckily, her large purse wasn't just for show, and she carried an emergency small umbrella inside. She pulled it out as she made her way to the exit, sprinting to her car that was parked on the side of the building. She entered her car with her legs still outside so she could shake the umbrella out a bit before placing it on her passenger side floor mat. She got fully in and put her purse on the passenger seat and closed the door. With her keys in her hand, she looked up into a rearview mirror and was met with the piercing blue eyes of the man. Brianna let out a loud scream, but the man grabbed her and pressed a needle into her neck injecting her with something that instantly burned within her veins. Brianna pressed really hard on her horn right as thunderstruck. The man let out a loud, sinister laugh. <laughs> Luck is on my side today, Brianna, he said, staring at her through the rearview mirror. Brianna stared at him back tears forming in her eyes before her body went limp and her eyes closed. The man left her in the car while he pulled his next to hers. He looked around to make sure that there wasn't any onlookers. The only cameras were close to the bar area, and he avoided these. He didn't see any outside, but he kept his hat down just in case. 
The heavy rain also provided a nice and natural cover. He opened his passenger side door and slid Brianna in. He hummed happily as he drove away with her motionless right next to him. Part 9 Brianna felt the man lift her from the car. He breathed heavily as he carried her. She listened to the sound of leaves and breaking twigs under his feet. The rain had lightened up, but the thunder was still intense during their long drive. The man had given her another small injection halfway through the drive while explaining to her how beautiful and perfect her skin is, how he couldn't resist her, how she would add wonderfully to his collection. He lifted her with a grunt over his shoulder as she heard him open what sounded like a rusty door. He carried her carefully down some stairs, his footsteps making a thudding noise. Soon, Brianna heard the sound of crunching plastic and a strong vinegar stench filled her nose. Soon, she felt the coldness of metal as the man laid her on an examination table. He felt cheerful and excited as he hummed, unbuttoning his shirt. He was soaked from the rain and needed to change from his clothing before getting started. He looked over at Brianna and rubbed her soft leg, stopping at her thigh. You really are exquisite, he said smiling. He left briefly to another room where he quickly changed into his surgery garments and returned back. He turned on two large lights that were positioned on the sides of the table. His workstation was dimly lit and he wanted to see what he was doing. The entire room was draped carefully in heavy-duty plastic sheeting, even the floors. He turned around, his back to Brianna, to repair his instruments on a long metal toolbox that was pushed to the wall that he used to store his surgical equipment, including his drug-filled syringes. He carefully wiped his surgical scissors and scalpel with hydrogen peroxide when he heard the crunch of plastic sheeting. He spun around to see Brianna standing behind the examination table, a bottle of formaldehyde in her right hand. Brianna felt weak still, but mustered her strength. She had grabbed the first thing she saw, a large brown bottle of liquid on a small table on wheels pushed to the side. The man turned around, now wearing a blue surgical cap, mask, and smock. His eyes looked shocked as she tossed the bottle at his face, as much force as she could gather. It hit him in the head, knocking him back into his tools, causing him to drop the scalpel he held in his gloved hand. He let out a yelp as she used her body weight to push the metal table hard into him, pinning him against his toolbox. The table was heavy and made a horrendous scraping sound against the plastic on the concrete flooring. The man lost consciousness as blood streamed from a wound on his head. He slumped over at the waist, laying on the table limply. Her muscles still felt weak, but she pushed herself to run as quickly as possible. The place she was in was disconcerting. It was dark and smelled of strong chemicals. She existed the plastic-covered room through the door her legs feeling incredibly heavy. Her heart was beating out of her chest and she listened for the man through the loud thunder. She saw a bit of moonlight as she entered another dark room. The light shined through a small, filthy, rectangular window up top. Desperately, she felt around for a way out as her eyes adjusted a bit. The room was roughly the same size as the makeshift operation room and two walls were filled with hard plastic DIY shelving units. On the shelf to her right were surgical masks, gloves, aprons, and more brown bottles of liquid. Then on the middle shelf was a red grill lighter. She picked it up and pressed the button, praying it would light. The flicker of the flame brought more tears to her eyes and she could finally see a bit better. She moved around the room cautiously and stopped in her tracks at the second shelving unit. Sitting on the middle shelf was four mannequin heads, three with the dried out faces of two men and one woman stretched across them like Halloween masks. Brianna screamed, 
pinning around just to be met with human skin hanging up on lines by metal pins like demented articles of clothing. The skins were shiny and had been dried out and made to look almost leathery in appearance. Oh my God, she cried out, nearly falling backwards, leaving the room. Brianna ran back into the small hallway connecting the two rooms and looked around frantically. She saw in front of her, some feet away, a raggedy wooden staircase leading up to some double cellar doors. She headed up to it, gripping the lighter as she felt the tight and painful grip of the man's hand in her hair. Where do you think you're going, bitch? He screamed angrily. Part 10 Anna swung around, causing the man to twist her hair. She shoved the hill of her right hand as hard as possible into the man's nose, breaking it, causing him to let go of her hair and stumble backwards. He swung his right arm forward before losing balance, slicing her left arm with a scalpel. Brianna screamed, dropping the lighter. She attempted to run up the stairs when the man suddenly grabbed her by the legs, snatching her hard, causing it to hit her face and head on the stairs. She let out a desperate cry as she felt his arms wrap around her waist like a python, nearly squeezing the breath out of her as he lifted her up. You want to play with me, bitch? He screamed angrily as he spun around, slinging her across the concrete floor. He kicked a lighter accidentally with his foot, causing it to slide in the middle of the small area. The wind was knocked out of her. She let out a gasp for air as the man, his face now covered in blood from his hand and nose, straddled her on the ground, his back to the staircase. He raised the scalpel and stuck it harshly into her left shoulder. Brianna screamed loudly, tears flowing from her eyes. You belong to me, Brianna. I'm going to make sure you feel every single piece of skin I take. The man said scornfully, pulling the scalpel out slowly. Brianna looked at him with hatred as she lifted her right arm swiftly, raking her nails onto his face, pulling skin from his cheek. She twisted her body forcefully, causing them both to roll onto their sides. The man grabbed for her as she slid away, kicking him in the face and arms as hard as she could. Her adrenaline was rushing as she pulled herself off the concrete floor. She snatched the lighter and ran back into the dark room with the hanging skins. She reached around nervously, grabbing for the brown bottles of chemicals she saw earlier and found a line of them on the left wall. The man was laughing maniacally, screaming her name. Brianna! 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 My promise it will only hurt for a little while. There's no reason to run, you fucking bitch! He screamed insanely. Brianna held her breath, listening intently for him to come through the door. Everything went silent, and Brianna could only hear the sound of her own heart beating wildly in the storm outside. Suddenly, the man rushed in screaming, holding the scalpel like a knife in his right hand. Brianna grabbed a bottle and tossed it, hitting him in the chest, but it didn't deter him much. He barely stumbled and continued his pursuit. She grabbed another bottle and ran towards the hanging skins. She turned around facing the man. She was shaking, blood dripping from her arm and head, though she couldn't feel any pain. The man paused, a wild look in his eyes as he watched her. Her back was up against some of the hanging skins. He looked at her and back at the skins with a slight look of concern in his insane gaze. She understood he was worried about his human skins being damaged. The room was still dark and was only illuminated by the moonlight that came through the small rectangular window, but their eyes were now well adjusted. Brianna lit the lighter and held it close to one of the hanging skins. The man looked panicked and held out his gloved hands, the right one still holding the bloody scalpel. Move! 
or I'll set this place on fire, she screamed, looking at him. Do not fuck around, Brianna, the man yelled angrily, looking at the flickering flame. I mean it. I'll light this shit up like the 4th of July. Let me out. Now, she demanded, moving a little closer to the skin. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, you win, the man said, motioning for her to walk out the door. Drop the knife, she demanded. He let the scalpel hit the ground. It made a loud clink that made her jump. The man rushed towards her at full speed. Brianna swerved, pushing him so that he fell face first into the clothesline, knocking down the hanging skins. She ran frantically out the door and made her way towards the steps. The man screamed wildly behind her. He reached the steps. She felt the piercing sharpness of a scalpel cutting through the meat and muscle of her right calf like butter. She screamed out, falling down the steps. Using her left foot, she kicked the man in the face, sending him backwards. She threw the remaining bottle of liquid she had in her hand at him as he sat up. She lit the lighter and locked it in the on position. Looking at him with disgust, she tossed it towards him. The flame caught the chemicals and the man went up in a beautiful blaze of red and orange. He jumped up, screaming, ripping the surgery mask off. The fire spread quickly as the chemicals had also spilled across the concrete flooring and went up quickly like a sea of fire. The man stood in it, screaming like a demon in hell. Brianna felt weak as she was losing a lot of blood, her legs like they were wrapped in cinder blocks, especially her right one. The smoke from the fire was intense, blinding her and choking her. She coughed as she pushed herself forward up the stairs. Finally, making it to the double cellar doors, it took all of her strength to push upward and open one of the heavy doors. From within the burning cellar, she heard the man scream her name. Brianna! The rain was pouring down as lightning occasionally illuminated the night sky. Thunder roared as Brianna reached outside, falling on her knees. The fresh air made her lungs burn as she coughed, gasped, and drooled, trying to catch air. Smoke rose up from the cellar behind her. Brianna lifted herself up and closed the cellar door. She limped around the wet ground, pulling a thickish stick from the side that she could use to slide in between the handle. She limped around the wet ground, pulling a thickish stick from the side that she could use to slide between both handles of the doors. She wanted that bastard to roast. She ripped off another already hanging t-shirt she had on and used it to tie around the hemorrhaging leg as tight as she could. She let out a pained scream. The moon was full and the outside world was much brighter than the hell hole she had just escaped. She cried bitterly before forcing herself to stand up. She looked around and realized the cellar wasn't connected to anything. At least, not anymore. It was just there in the middle of some woods. She listened carefully and heard the distant sound of cars on a highway. The sound made her cry harder as she limped towards it, encouraging herself to keep moving forward, though she was tied, though her body had become weaker and weaker, though she was losing a lot of blood. She had to live. She thought about her parents and younger brother. As a family, they all had experienced the loss of her baby sister to Sid's. Due to this, her parents were overprotective over their remaining two children. They cried bitterly when she decided to go to university out of state. Her dad made her take self-defense classes and made her promise to remain careful and focused. If she were to die, they wouldn't be able to handle it. She had to live. She wanted to be a psychologist. She appreciated what they did for her mom during her depression. After her sister's passing, she 
wanted to help people through hard times as well. She wanted a family one day, a good husband and children of her own. She had to live. I want to live, Brianna said to herself, her face covered in rain, sweat, tears, and blood. She treaded along slowly, her body losing strength. She dragged her body along painfully, her right leg no longer wanting to move. Every step felt impossible, so she dragged her right leg behind. The sound of the highway grew closer, and she could see headlights peering through the trees. She limped even slower, but pushed forward. Finally, she had no longer heard the crunch of leaves and twigs, but felt the slippery hardness of wet asphalt. She raised her hand, fanning down traffic. She caught the attention of an approaching red SUV. The SUV came to an abrupt stop, just as Brianna collapsed to her knees. Exiting the SUV simultaneously, a middle-aged couple ran over to Brianna. As she was barely conscious, she heard the kind voice of the woman. Oh my God, honey, call 911, the woman yelled worriedly. No, he could be after me, Brianna managed to say before fully collapsing. The man caught Brianna before her head could hit the pavement. He heard crunching noises and looked towards the woods. He could see and smell smoke in the distance. He could also feel someone watching. It caused the hair to stand on the back of his neck. Call the police in the car, honey. We'll drive her to St. Mary's, he said, lifting Brianna up with ease. The kind man placed Brianna carefully in the back seat while his wife called 911. They drove quickly to the hospital. Part 11 The sound of chiming bells woke Detective Addison up with a jerk. He looked over at the half-covered officer, Lena, sleeping soundly next to him. He turned over groggily and picked up his cell from the side table. The time read 4.02 a.m. Lena stirred beside him, waking up. Who is it at this time of morning? She asked, brushing her brunette hair from her pretty face. Who else? It's the precinct, Detective Addison said, answering the phone. Captain Finnegan was on the other end with a raspy voice. Rise and shine, Detective. We've got a major lead in the skinning case, he said enthusiastically. Detective Addison sat up in bed and listened to the information carefully. A young woman was brought into St. Mary's Hospital. Before going into surgery, she regained consciousness and said she was kidnapped by a man who drugged her and tried to skin her alive. She was able to escape, though injured, and was found by a couple of civilians. The civilians were able to give directions to where the girl was found, and the crime scene technicians found something there. Detective Addison leaped from the bed, startling Lena. He thanked Captain Finnegan after obtaining the directions and immediately dialed Joseph. Joseph answered the phone after only two rings, sounding if he was already awake. Guess what, rookie? We found where that son of a bitch does his killing. And we have a witness, Detective Addison said, smiling. I'm getting dressed now, Joseph responded, matching his excitement. I told the hospital to call me right away when the witness wakes up, Detective Addison said to Joseph, as they drove speedily down the highway. Joseph nodded as his mind raced. The location given was close to the city's border and was near a wide two-lane highway and heavily wooded area. It took just over 45 minutes at top speed to make it there. They knew they had reached the right area when they saw the line of police cars and white crime scene vans lined up on the roadside. Orange cones were placed strategically in the street to redirect traffic as a new uniformed cops wearing yellow vests acted as traffic controllers to stop any traffic pausers and onlookers. Detective Addison showed his police badge and one of the officers moved a wooden barricade for them to drive through. Detective Addison parked carefully behind one of the crime technician vans. Joseph jumped out of the car and noted the smoky chemical smell that hung in the air. 
The ground was still wet, but the sky was finally clear. The sun was just rising, painting the sky in brilliant colors of yellow, orange, and red. Detective Addison stepped out and made their walk into the woods, where they met Phil, who, along with the other crime scene technicians, was dressed in a head-to-toe white disposable bodysuit, a half-faced breathing apparatus covering his mouth, which he pulled down with his gloved left hand as they approached. Welcome, fellas. I think this is our guy, Philip said, motioning for his assistant to bring two more masks and some booties. What's with the masks? Joseph asked, accepting the supplies from the assistant with a thank you. There was a chemical fire, formaldehyde and some other substances. Breathing that stuff in, normal circumstances, is dangerous. Burning it, however, creates toxic gases, Phil said, leading the way. Isn't formaldehyde explosive? I'm surprised a crime scene still exists. Detective Addison said, frowning at his boot stepping into the muddy ground. It is, however. It was probably watered down. At least that's my guess, Phil said, stopping at burned cellar doors that had been propped open. Small battery lights had been placed inside, illuminating the otherwise dark and smoky space. Wow, how are we supposed to get down there? Joseph asked, looking down into the ashy and smoky pit. Only a piece of staircase remained, and it was unstable. Philip motioned for them to follow them further. They walked a small distance away to a silver trap door that was flushed to the ground. Down it was a narrow staircase. They followed Phil down with their face masks, booties, and gloves on through a short hallway. They entered a charred room through a burnt door with a half-melted, half-duty DIY shelving unit pushed away from it. Crime scene technicians were busy at work taking samples, dusting away soot, and collecting what they could find. Joseph looked up and saw what remained of human skin that had been hung up. Only a small piece the size of his hand still dangled from a silver pin on a half-downed blackened line. Is that what I think it is? Joseph asked. Yes, but that's not the craziest thing, Phil said, motioning them to follow across the room. They stopped in front of a large still storage trunk that was covered in soot. We found this in the corner. It wasn't locked, Phil said, opening the trunk. Inside were the skins of multiple animals and three human scalps, with the hair still on them. Part 12 Are those fucking scalps? Detective Addison said, disgusted. Yep, I'm pretty sure they belong to over three victims and over there... Phil closed the trunk and turned his attention to another partially melted and charred DIY shelving unit. And those bags are where we found what was left of our victims' faces, pinned on mannequin heads, Phil said solemnly. This guy, ugh, he's sick, Joseph said, feeling a twinge of nauseation stirring in his gut. Yeah, follow me, watch your step. Phil said, walking cautiously out of the ash-filled room. He led them into another room roughly the same size, where the first part of the walls looked, especially like melted plastic as thick plastic sheeting that become flush to its surface. The floor was covered in thick plastic sheeting. Some of the sheeting had shrunken size due to the fire. The far wall was not as burned by the flames, and another door was propped open, leading into a small hidden room where they could hear the hum of a generator. The room they stood in contained a soot-covered examination table and two large burnt lights with extension cords that led into the smaller room. They watched as the crime scene technicians seized the rest of the instruments, tools, and drugs that weren't destroyed from a metal toolbox. 
So this is where that bastard tortured and murdered his victims, Detective Addison said angrily. Yeah, we found bottles of rock uranium and a bunch of syringes. This way, Phil said, leading them through the room and into the smaller room. Inside the smaller room was a large but surprisingly quiet, chargeable generator. Connected to the generator was a long, white chest freezer, pushed to the wall. Inside, it was lined perfectly with thin plastic sheeting that was caked with frozen blood. This is where he kept them cold, Joseph said, fighting his nausea. I believe so. We'll know for sure after testing the blood samples we took, Phil said, looking at Detective Addison and Joseph. Any chances of pulling fingerprints? Detective Addison asked, furring his brow. We found some, but we're unsure if they're our suspects or our victims, Phil replied. Great work, Phil. Okay, rookie, Captain Finnegan has got some guys looking into who this property belongs to. Hopefully that will give us a name, Detective Addison said, turning his attention to Joseph. Before Joseph could respond, Detective Addison's phone rang. He answered the call quickly. The call lasted but seconds before he hung up with a thank you. He looked at Joseph over his half face mask. Let's roll, rookie. Our witness is awake, Detective Addison said. They thanked Phil and made their way out. Joseph was secretly grateful to leave the cellar. Besides, the uncomfortable breathing apparatus on his face, the smell of chemicals and smoke, he felt extremely uncomfortable being in the place where the killer skinned his victims alive. The place was heavy with suffering and fear that he could feel in the pit of his stomach. He looked at Detective Addison as they made their way back to the stairs and into fresh air again. They walked a ways away before removing their masks and booties. Detective Addison didn't waste time pulling a cigarette out of his pants pocket and lighting it as they walked to the car. It was completely light outside. The sun shone brightly, casting shadows on the wet grass and muddy grounds of the trees. They drove to the hospital discussing the case, feeling more hopeful than before since they finally had some solid leads, especially with a living witness. Joseph was worried. Detective Addison wasn't the softest of people and pretty direct in questioning. He wondered if he could take the lead in asking the witness about her experience and the suspect. Before he could ask, Detective Addison spoke up as they pulled into St. Mary's Hospital. Listen, rookie, I'll do the questioning in there, okay? He said, peering over at Justin as he parked. Um, oh... Okay, Joseph said reluctantly. They walked into the large hospital and was led by a nurse to the right floor and area. A lovely female doctor with striking green eyes and auburn hair greeted them, her hands in her white lab coat. She removed her right hand to shake theirs and introduced herself as Dr. Rebecca Sullivan. It's nice to meet you. We spoke briefly on the phone. I'm Detective Addison and this is my partner, Detective Ramirez, Detective Addison said politely. My pleasure. Um, before you go in there to speak with Mrs. Moore, please understand that she may still be out of it. Mrs. Moore suffers with a gene disorder that causes her to rapidly metabolize medications. Due to this, we have to keep her on a controlled stream of medications. From what I understand, it's this disorder that saved her life. Dr. Sullivan said, with a concerned look and tone. Is she coherent enough to answer some questions? Detective Addison asked, looking serious. Uh, maybe a few, Dr. Sullivan said softly. She led them into the hospital room that was guarded by two uniformed cops. Joseph stepped in and looked at the battered but still beautiful young woman that sat propped up on two pillows in the hospital bed. One side of her face was badly bruised and swollen. Her hair was up in a fluffy, coily ponytail, while white flannel bandages wrapped a wound around her head. 
Her hospital gown was off the left shoulder and arm as that was heavily bandaged. Her right leg was bandaged and propped up on a pillow. Multiple medications slowly dripped from bags dangling from an IV stand in her right forearm. Joseph's heart hurt for her immediately. Dr. Sullivan excused herself with a slight smile. Hello, Mrs. Moore. I'm Detective Addison, and this is my partner, Detective Ramirez. I know that you are in a lot of pain right now, but is it okay if we ask you a few questions? Detective Addison asked in a surprisingly gentle voice. Joseph was taken aback by the kind voice that came out from Detective Addison's mouth. His body language was less intimidating as well. He seemed to transform into a different person before his eyes. The young woman looked at them and furled her brows and lifted up a bit more in her bed. She made a pained expression. May I ask you something first? She asked in a raspy, soft voice. Of course, Detective Addison replied, walking closer to her to hear her more clearly. Did I kill that motherfucker? She asked angrily. Part 13 I'm sorry. My mouth isn't usually this bad. I just really hope he's dead, she said, looking intensely at Detective Addison and Joseph. Detective Addison and Joseph remained quiet, and the young woman leaned back and let out a pained laugh. Tears fell from her eyes and rolled down the side of her face. She turned her head to look out the large window that covered a decent portion of the left wall and stared out into the daylight, swiping away her tears with her right hand. I already knew when I saw the cops outside the door that he survived. But I was hoping, she said, turning back to face them. There was another exit. Detective Addison replied in a sympathetic tone. Detective Addison pulled up a visitor's chair and took a seat. Joseph stood next to him with a serious look on his face. He pulled out his pad and pen and watched Detective Addison closely. Mrs. Moore, we... Brianna or Bree, please. Call me Brianna or Bree, Brianna interjected. Okay, um, Brianna... Can you tell us everything that happened yesterday? Detective Addison asked softly. Brianna recounted her ordeal in full detail from the bar to her brave escape. Joseph noticed goosebumps on her arm and the occasional quiver in her voice as she spoke. Tears spilled from her eyes as she spoke about being locked in her own body, unable to move or talk, knowing what his plans were for her. She started shaking, and Detective Addison held her hand gently. Joseph was shocked, impressed, and relieved. He was still learning the many sides of Detective Addison. Brianna asked about her car that was presumably left at the bar. We'll have some uniforms go there now, Detective Addison reassured her. <laughs> will, will he come for me here? I mean, he knows where I go to school. His notebook had my university's name on it, and he could know where I live, Brianna asked worriedly. We are not going to let that happen. Brianna, if we can get a sketch artist in here today, can you give a detailed description of what the man that did this to you looks like? Detective Addison asked sternly. Yes, Brianna responded. Detective Addison nodded, excused himself, and got up to make the necessary calls in the hallway. Joseph sat down in the visitor's chair and gave a tender smile to Brianna. You are very brave, Brianna, he said earnestly. I don't know if I would call in that. It, it's more like a will to survive, she replied, looking down at her bandaged leg. Regardless, you fought back and got out. That's amazing, Joseph said, sounding proud. That's all thanks to my dad. He insisted on me taking self-defense lessons when I told him I planned on going to university out of state, she replied, seeming more relaxed. 
good thing he did, but I can tell even without that, you're a fighter, Joseph said, making eye contact with Brianna. My mom says the same thing. I had some health issues growing up. My mom says, I've always been a fighter, Brianna said, her face taking on a dejected look. Where is your family? Are they coming up here to be with you? Joseph asks softly. My home state was hit with some pretty nasty storms the last few days, and my particular city took on a lot of damage. I was able to speak with my parents briefly before you guys showed up, and they said they wouldn't be able to travel to me for a few days, Brianna said, swiping newly dropped tears from her face. I'm sure they wish they could be here now. Joseph said, grabbing a small box of facial tissues from an overbed table that was pushed to the wall. Yeah, they were freaking out. My mom couldn't stop crying, Brianna replied, grabbing the box with a thank you. I also warned my roommate to stay at her parents, just in case that freak knows where we live. Now, now, I'm, I'm all alone. Brianna said sadly, more tears welling up in her large brown eyes. Joseph grabbed her hand gently, just as Detective Addison had done earlier, and gave it a gentle squeeze. Looking into her eyes, he gave her a reassuring smile. You're not alone, Brianna. We're here, and we're going to keep you safe. Trust me when I say that, okay? Joseph said warmly. Brianna smiled back at him as Detective Addison walked back in with his cell still in hand. We have some promising news, Detective Addison said, directing his statement to both Joseph and Brianna. The emergency staff did a wonderful job and secured the suspect's skin sample from under Miss Moore, I mean Miss Brianna's fingernails. We have his DNA, Detective Addison said happily. Which means we may have his ID, Joseph said, turning his attention back to Brianna, hoping this news would comfort her. But until he's actually found, I still can't feel safe, Brianna said, with fear in her eyes. The police detail will remain here with you for your protection, Detective Addison said kindly. Brianna nodded, but still looked unconvinced. She leaned back on her pillows, her body noticeably quivering. Detective Addison and Joseph made eye contact and a mutual unspoken understanding developed between them. Would you feel better if one of us stayed up here for a while? Detective Addison said softly. Brianna's face lit up as she sat up in her bed. She winced as she repositioned her back and left arm. If it's not too much trouble... She repeated quietly. All right, rookie, you hang here while I go check in with Captain Finnegan and Phil. The sketch artist should be here in a few hours. I'll keep you posted. Detective Addison said with a nod towards Joseph before exiting. Joseph nodded and returned his attention back to Brianna, who looked a lot more relaxed and confident. He gave a gentle smile, which she returned before leaning back into her pillows. Within minutes, she felt comfortable enough to close her eyes and allow herself to sleep. She drifted off under the close watch of Joseph. The man leaned against his wall, washing down painkillers with a bottle of whiskey. He winced in pain, looking down at his red, blistered, and swollen left arms. Some of the burns were to the epidermis and dermis layers of his skin. While he was thankful that the ones to his neck and face were superficial and only affected the epidermis layer. If it weren't for the fire retardant gel he always wore for protection just in case, the damage would have been much, much worse. Even catastrophic. He was no fool and knew working with flammable liquids in a dim and closed-in space could lead to a potential fire. However... He never would have made such a mistake. It was that bitch, Brianna. 
He slammed the back of his head, harshly multiple times, into his wall, thinking of Brianna. She had destroyed his work, his lab, and his perfect skin. Brianna, he said, tears rolling down his face. He knew he would have to take her skin. Part 14 Brianna was awakened by the soft touch of Joseph. He softly nudged her upright arm and called her name gently. She opened her eyes and was still light outside. She peeked at the clock on the hospital wall that sat above a whiteboard that listed the name of her doctor, nurse, and room number. She had slept deeply since the early morning, and now it was evening. She looked at Joseph, who gave her a gentle smile. I'm sorry to disturb your rest, Brianna. The forensic sketch artist is here. Is it okay if she comes in? Joseph asked calmly. Oh, yeah, sure. Brianna replied, lifting herself up in bed. Joseph walked to the door and opened it, waving in a short and shapely, light-skinned black woman. She wore micro-braids that were neatly made into a high bun. Her hazel eyes sparkled in the bright room light. She was stylish with a white quarter sleeve jacket. Black beaded bracelets lined her right arm and matched her black shirt and shiny black jeans. Short heels, black boots finished her ensemble. She carried a large black bag that hung from her right shoulder. She smiled at Brianna warmly and introduced herself as Officer Tatiana Crenshaw. Joseph politely led her to the visitor's chair and excused himself from the room after letting Brianna know he would be just in the hallway. Officer Crenshaw's voice was calming as she explained the process to Brianna. She reached in the large bag and pulled out a large sketch pad. Crossing her legs, she began her questions about the man's appearance down to every small detail. His face was permanently etched into Brianna's mind. She described him from memory, trying hard not to tear up. The process took a little over an hour before Officer Crenshaw turned the sketch pad around so Brianna could see if everything was correct. Immediately, goosebumps covered her body, and she couldn't hold back her tears any longer. Not because she was afraid or sad, but because she was angry. Yeah, that's him, Brianna said with disgust. Detective Addison walked with anticipation into Philip's lab. He was taken aback by the state of it when he entered. The lab was filled with what was found in the suspect's hideaway, including the melted mannequin heads that still had pieces of human faces on them, were propped up on an examination table alongside the human scalps. On another table, the dead animal skins. Phil and his assistants were busy standing over yet another table and didn't notice Detective Addison's presence. Detective Addison cleared his throat loudly and Phil turned around. Phil gave him an acknowledging nod and returned to one of his assistants with some instructions on what to do with the burnt remaining pieces of human skin that was before them. Hey, sorry about that, Carlson. So much to do here, Phil said, walking to a small silver table where he picked up his digital pad. Uh, yeah, I can see that, Detective Addison said, trying hard to ignore the mannequin heads and scalps. Hey, uh, where's your partner? Phil asked curiously. He's with the witness, Detective Addison reported. Oh, okay. So we got some fingerprint and DNA matches already, and they belong to our victims, Phil said, showing Detective Addison his digital pad. What about the suspect? Detective Addison asked, sounding irritated. From the prints and DNA we pulled, it's just the victims, Phil said, dolefully. How is that even possible? Detective Addison griped. I'm not sure. More than likely, he made sure to always wear gloves, Philip replied, pacing his digital pad back on the table. And the skins, scalps, and uh, faces? Our victims, 
correct? Detective Addison asked, crossing his arms. Yeah, it appears so, Phil said, his face taking on a woeful look. Hey, we're still not done. They also pulled prints from the witness's car and seat. We could get a hit there, Philip said in a reassuring voice. Yeah, maybe. This bastard is slippery, though. He's been able to avoid cameras and witnesses. He's like a fucking ghost, Detective Addison said, dropping his arms. Well, you have the girl. She's a living witness. One is enough. As long as we can identify him, he's toast, Phil replied, his voice taking a lighter tone. Eh, thanks, Phil. Call me if anything else comes up, Detective Addison said, giving a half-hearted wave. Detective Addison walked to his car and got in. He leaned his head back on the headrest, closing his eyes. Suspects like this killer sickened him the most. He wanted to nail this son of a bitch no matter what. This killer was smarter, however. He clearly knew how to cover his tracks well. Other than his grotesque handiwork and some vague descriptions, they had no real leads. The sound of his cell snatched him from his racing thoughts. It was Captain Finnegan. He sat up and answered respectively. We have a description of the suspect, Addison. I'm sending it to your phone now, Captain Finnegan said. Detective Addison hung up with a thank you as his message notification dinged. A well-drawn digital picture of an attractive white male with blue eyes, dirty blonde hair, and medium skin tone appeared before him. Detective Addison's eyes narrowed as he looked at the man's face. There you are, you sick piece of shit he said angrily. Part 15 Joseph looked down at the message on his phone. Captain Finnegan was requested that he, Detective Addison, and quite a few uniformed cops retrace their steps with the composite sketch of the suspect in hopes that someone could offer more information. Joseph looked at Brianna, who was slowly eating her breakfast of scrambled eggs and toast, on a overbed table. He had spent the entire night there watching over her. They had the occasional conversation when she was awake. He had assisted her to and from the restroom on multiple occasions and helped her take her medicine. He had food delivered and slept for a few hours uncomfortably in the visitor's chair as to not leave her side. She seemed more relaxed with him there. He found her to be a strong, intelligent, and brave young woman, and he hated to leave her as he didn't want her to be afraid. Hey, Brianna, I have to leave for work in a bit. I'll have one of the officers come in and sit here with you, okay? Joseph said softly. Brianna put down her fork and looked at Joseph, giving him a dejected smile. I understand. Thank you for staying here with me overnight. I was able to rest with you here, she said, looking down at her tray sadly. Um, if it's okay with my captain and partner, I can come back tonight, Joseph said warmly. I would like that. Thank you, Brianna said softly. Joseph called a ride to his apartment where he quickly showered and dressed. He met Detective Addison at Cypress Lake where they found a body of Jackson Lawson. They asked around, showing people the drawing of the man. They visited every location, including the bar where Brianna was kidnapped. Some people said he looked slightly familiar, but no one had any information that was substantial. Joseph and Detective Addison headed back to the precinct to complete paperwork, feeling disappointed. Captain Finnegan walked up, his hands on his hips. Anything new on the skinning case, fellas? He said critically. Not anything new yet, sir, Detective Addison responded in a frustrated tone. Listen, we can't drag our feet on this. Before Captain Finnegan could finish, Officer Lena ran in excitedly stopping in front of Detective Addison's desk. Excuse me, Captain, we have a hit on the idea of the skinning suspect, she said smiling at Detective Addison. 
Detective Addison jumped from his chair and Joseph sat up. They all turned their attention to Officer Lena as she explained that while asking around, she came across a man named Zachariah Hoffman, who recognized the drawing as Dr. Andreas Remini. Doctor? Detective Addison asked loudly. Yep, and guess what kind? Lena asked, smiling wildly. Out with it, fair child, Captain Finnegan griped. Sorry, Captain. He's a plastic surgeon specializing in body contouring and skin removal, she said gleefully. Great fucking job, Officer Lena, Detective Addison yelled out, causing Officer Lena to blush. Okay, great. You two pull up everything on Dr. Andreas Rim and I. I want to know everything about him. I'll get started on obtaining the warrants. Captain Finnegan said, finally looking happy. Yes, Captain, and then we will pay the good doctor a visit, Detective Addison said, narrowing his eyes. It didn't take long before Joseph and Detective Addison pulled up at the location of where Dr. Andreas Rimini worked. He was a private practice surgeon that owned his own clinic, the Rimini Clinic. His website listed his medical achievements, awards, and years of philanthropy throughout the world. Joseph scrolled down and stopped at the photo of Dr. Rimini and colleagues. He was truly a dead ringer for the suspect composite. He was smiling brightly in his lab coat with his dirty blonde hair combed back perfectly, his piercing blue eyes sparkling along with his perfectly straight white teeth. An address and phone number were located at the bottom of the web page. Joseph wrote them down. This guy is squeaky clean, not even a traffic violation, Detective Addison said, looking at his computer. I have his clinic's address. We can go there as soon as we get the arrest and search warrants, Joseph replied anxiously. Captain Finnegan bolted from his office with documents in hand. He headed straight to Detective Addison and Joseph with a smile. Judge Tanner was available. We have the warrants, fellas, he said, handing Detective Addison the document. Let's go, rookie, Detective Addison said, grabbing his jacket from his chair. They hurried out the precinct along with some uniformed officers and headed to the Remini Clinic, which was 40 minutes away from the precinct. They went there, sirens blazing to bypass traffic. They made it there in 30 minutes and walked boldly into the contemporary off-white clinic. It was quite large, and the front let in a lot of lights by way of large, tall windows. The light gray limestone flooring glistened in the sunlight. They pushed through the double doors and entered a large room where an attractive receptionist sat in a long white desk with a surprisingly silent, large, flat waterfall behind her. Baby blue pleather seating adorned both sides of the room as two TVs quietly played different programs. Their arrival piqued the interest of a few patients sitting in the waiting room who looked at them with puzzlement and concern. The attractive receptionist smiled and stood up as Detective Addison and Joseph walked to the desk, warrants in hand. How can I help you, gentlemen? She asked in a polite voice with a strained smile. Where is Dr. Andreas Remini? Detective Addison asked coldly, showing his detective badge that was clipped to his belt. Um, Mr. Remini is finishing up with a surgery right now, the receptionist said, whose name tag read Claudia, responded nervously. Bring him out, Detective Addison demanded, narrowing his eyes. Excuse me, please, Claudia said nervously. Claudia left from behind the desk in a hurry and used the key card to open yet another set of double doors, which she ran through. Detective Addison had already instructed some uniforms to cover the other exits, just in case Dr. Rim and I tried to run. They waited there for ten minutes before Claudia returned with a tall man behind her wearing a surgical cap, mask, and smock. The smock had a bit of blood on it. He removed his mask, revealing himself as Dr. Remini. 
He looked surprised and irritated to see Detective Addison, Joseph, and the uniform cops there. What is this about? He asked angrily, his piercing blue eyes glistening. Joseph noticed that his left side of his face contained a scratch that looked like it was on the beginning stages of healing. Andreas Remini, you are under arrest, Detective Addison said, handing Dr. Remini his copy of the arrest warrant. Uh, what for? What is going on? Dr. Remini asked desperately as Detective Addison grabbed him and cuffed him. Joseph handed the receptionist the search warrant as Detective Addison read Dr. Remini his Miranda rights, despite his protest. Joseph explained they would need access to Dr. Remini's information, schedule, and office. Claudia stood still in shock. The patients in the waiting area all muttered under their breaths, a few pulling out their phones to record the scene. One of the uniformed officers firmly asked them to put their phones away to Joseph's apprehension. As Detective Addison walked Dr. Remini out the door, he yelled back to Claudia desperately. Claudia, call Mona. Tell her to call Walter and have him meet me at the police station, he yelled. Yes, Dr. Remini, Claudia responded, looking frightened. Joseph obtained the requested information and questioned Claudia before meeting Detective Addison outside. Dr. Remini sat looking dumbfounded and panicked at the back of a police car. Detective Addison gave the go-ahead for the uniform officer to take Dr. Remini to the precinct as he and Joseph drove ahead. We got our guy, Detective Addison, Joseph said, feeling strangely numb on the inside. He looked over at Detective Addison, who was quiet, with a stoic look on his face. Detective Addison? Joseph repeated. Oh, um, what's that, rookie? He asked. I said we finally have our guy, Joseph repeated. Um, I hope so, Detective Addison replied, narrowing his eyes. Part 16 The precinct was buzzing with activity as Detective Addison and Joseph walked in with Dr. Remini in handcuffs. Dr. Remini had remained adamant about knowing the reason for his arrest, but was otherwise cooperative. Captain Finnegan came from his office briskly with a serious and intimidating look on his face. He walked towards Detective Addison and Joseph, keeping his eyes on Dr. Remini. Usually, suspects would go through the booking process right away, which included recording their personal information, such as their full name and social security number, taking their booking photographs, collecting their fingerprints, documenting their charges, amongst other things. The process was lengthy, but Captain Finnegan had instructed them to wait until after the interrogation. He also instructed Detective Addison to take Dr. Remini to interrogation room three. They walked there under the whispers and gazes of what felt like the entire police department. Dr. Remini remained compliant as he entered the eight foot by 10 foot carpeted gray room. He was uncuffed and sat at the table in a straight back, armless black chair. Hey, is anyone going to tell me why the hell I'm here? He demanded as Detective Addison and Joseph left him in the room. How do you want to handle this, Captain? Detective Addison asked. Let's read him his rights again and get forensics in here to collect our DNA sample and compare it to what was found under Miss Moore's nails. Once we have that, we can't deny his involvement. We need a confession if possible, Captain Finnegan said, looking through the one-way mirror at Dr. Remini, who sat nervously in his chair. Yes, sir. Are you ready, rookie? Detective Addison asked, looking solemnly at Joseph. Yeah, I'm ready, Joseph replied, straightening his back. He held a cream-colored folder right under his arm. They walked into the interrogation room together, sternly, and faced a nervous Dr. Remini. Detective Addison read him his rights once more and made sure he understood them fully. Dr. Remini leaned across the table, his hands clasped together, his piercing blue eyes staring intently at them. 
Why am I here? He said coldly. Detective opened the file and placed the photos of Jackson Lawson, Simon Han, and Carly Dickerson before Dr. Remni. He sat back in his chair, looking at the photos in bewilderment. Are you familiar with these people, Dr. Remni? Joseph asked. No, they're not my patients. Should I be? He asked, looking up at Detective Addison and Joseph. We have reason to believe you might be involved in their murders, Detective Addison replied. M murder What? I've done no such thing, Dr. Rem and I screamed, angrily, standing up from his chair. Sit down, Dr. Rem and I, Joseph demanded sternly. Who the hell is this kid? Dr. Rem and I asked angrily, directing his question towards Joseph. I'm not a kid. I'm a detective, and I need you to take a seat now, Joseph said firmly, yet calmly, his face taking on a domineering tone. Dr. Rem and I complied and sat back in his chair. He furrowed his brows and let out an exasperated breath. I want my lawyer. I'm not saying another damn thing without my lawyer, Dr. Rem and I said, sitting back in his chair stone-faced. Detective Addison collecting the photos from the table. He and Joseph exited the room and joined Captain Finnegan. They watched Dr. Remini through the one-way mirror. After a few moments alone, Dr. Remini let out a deep breath. Fear shrouded his face and worry danced in his eyes. Beads of sweat formed on his forehead. He clenched his hands into fists on the table before putting them in his lap. What do you think, Captain? Detective Addison asked. He looked like he genuinely didn't recognize our victims. He also looked scared shitless in there. Captain Finnegan said, narrowing his eyes. Yeah, he's either a really good actor or maybe he's not. Detective Addison was intrigued by a loud, boisterous voice. Excuse me, where's my client? They walked around the corner to a short, round man with black rimmed glasses covering his dark brown eyes. He wore a wrinkled gray suit with a navy blue tie and held a stylish black leather briefcase in his right hand. He had a horseshoe hairline giving his head the look of a cul-de-sac. He looked like the most lawyer of lawyers Joseph had ever seen as he looked around the precinct, sweating around his collar. Captain Finnegan walked up to him politely. Hello, I'm Captain Colin Finnegan, and who are you? He asked kindly. I'm Walter Levine. Sorry for my appearance. Wasn't expecting to be here today. I came in a rush. I'm Andreas, Remini's attorney, he replied, extending his chubby hand for a shake. Captain Finnegan shook his hand, though he was taken aback. Usually even the best attorneys didn't show up right away. This guy appeared very quickly. Captain Finnegan led Mr. Levine to interrogation room three while answering his questions and handing him the necessary documents regarding the case. Mr. Levine remained polite, but his demeanor became quite stoic as he entered into the room. Dr. Remini immediately stood up to greet his lawyer, and he seemed to relax a bit at seeing him. They say I murdered people, Walter, Dr. Rem and I exclaimed. Calm down, Andreas. Let me look over everything, Mr. Levine said, calmly pulling one of the chairs from the other side of the table and sitting down. He read through the documents carefully, including the warrants and the evidence gathered so far. One of Phil's assistants, Sean Williams, was a young man of delicate appearance, walked in holding a medium silver box. I'm here to take the buckle swab, the young man said in a surprisingly deep voice for such a effeminate looking individual. Detective Addison opened the door to interrogation room three, interrupting a conversation between Mr. Levine and Dr. Remini. He explained what the lab technician was there for. The young man walked in and set the silver box on the table. He explained, in simple terms, what he would be doing to Dr. Remini's irritation. I know what a buckle swab is. I'm a physician. I don't consent to this, Dr. Remini said angrily. 
They have a warrant, Andreas, Mr. Levine said, putting his hand up to calm Dr. Remini. Dr. Remini reluctantly opened his mouth as the young man took a cheek swab and placed it securely in a tube, and the tube into a thick envelope. He placed everything back into the silver box and thanked Dr. Remini and Mr. Levine before exiting into the hallway. We'll run a rapid DNA test. We'll have something for you all in about one to two hours max, the young man said, smiling politely. Great news. Thank you, Captain Finnegan responded as the technician walked away. Let's continue with the questioning, rookie, Detective Addison said, looking at Joseph and Captain Finnegan. Captain Finnegan gave the go-ahead as they entered the room again. Tensions were high and Dr. Remini looked angrier than he did before. Is my client being criminally charged, detectives? Mr. Levine said seriously. We have some questions, Detective Addison said, sitting down across from Mr. Levine and Dr. Remini. Joseph handed Detective Addison a file which contained Dr. Remini's work schedule and among other documents. He placed the schedule down before Dr. Remini and Mr. Levine. He also placed the approximate dates the murders took place next to the schedule. We checked your schedule, doctor. Where were you on these dates? The victims were murdered. You didn't have any scheduled surgeries. We also asked around to your neighbors and apparently they didn't see your car on these dates either, Detective asked, leaning back in his chair. Dr. Remini looked at his attorney, who shook his head with approval, and back at Detective Addison. I have an explanation for that, he replied, agitated. Part 17 Please explain, doctor, Detective Addison said solemnly. Twice a year, I go out to Lannan Woods to fish and camp for a week or two to meditate and recenter. That's where I was, Dr. Remini replied, tapping his pointer finger on the desk harshly. Is there anyone who can collaborate that? Did you go with anyone there? Detective Addison asked. I always go alone. That's the point, to be alone with nature, he replied angrily. Dr. Remini... You have to understand, that isn't going to work for an alibi. Are you sure no one saw you there? You didn't speak with anyone over the days you were there? Detective Addison asked, sitting up in his chair. I've been doing the same thing for 15 years. My wife and daughter can tell you that. And no, I purposely limit communication with anyone outside of my family and staff, Dr. Remini replied angrily. So you don't have an alibi, Detective Addison responded coldly. I just told you where I was. My car's GPS tracker will have it logged. You can check that, Dr. Remini replied, breathing hard. Mr. Levine frowned and placed a hand on Dr. Remini's shoulder to calm him down. He gave it a gentle squeeze. Dr. Remini took a few deep breaths before relaxing back in his chair. Mr. Levine looked down at the case paperwork and cleared his throat. <clears throat> um, the evidence you have so far is just a description from a witness and a possible job title of the suspect, correct, detectives? I think we all know it's going to take a lot more than that to prove my client had anything to do with the unfortunate murders of these victims or the attempted murder of the witness, Mr. Levine said calmly. How did you get that scratch on your face? Joseph asked, pointing to his own face where Dr. Remini's scratch was located. This? I wasn't paying attention while looking for my camping spot, and I was snagged by a sharp twig. It's no big deal, he replied, rubbing his finger across the scratch. The witness scratched the suspect on the left cheek during a tussle, Joseph replied, frowning. I was snagged by a twig, Dr. Remini reiterated. So, no alibi you can prove, and a scratch on the same side of your face the witness testified to, Detective Addison said, settling back down in his chair again. 
Is my client being criminally charged or not, Detective? Your evidence is circumstantial at best, Mr. Levine said, irritated. Dr. Rem and I, it rained a lot during those dates. Do you ever camp in such weather? Detective Addison asked, ignoring Mr. Levine. Yes, I prefer it, actually. The rain calms me. Besides, my gear is well equipped to handle all weather, he replied smugly. Detective Addison snickered sarcastically and continued with the interrogation, sometimes asking the same questions in a different way to Dr. Remini's irritation. Detective Addison pressed hard on Dr. Remini's lack of a believable alibi, his profession and what a possible motive might be. Joseph asked him again, did he know the victims? Had he contacted any of them or been in contact by them? Dr. Rem and I remained adamant that he had no affiliation with the victims and that he was innocent. The interrogation was intense yet civil as Mr. Levine made sure that Dr. Rem and I didn't say anything incriminating or lose his composure. Before they had realized, 90 minutes had passed. Can I see the sketch? Dr. Remney asked, looking mentally exhausted. Detective Addison pulled out a print of the subject, facial composite, and slid it in front of Dr. Remney. Immediately, his face went pale as he inhaled, holding his breath. He lifted the sketch to his face and stared at it wide-eyed. Detective Addison and Joseph made eye contact with one another. Do you have something to tell us, Dr. Rem and I? Detective Addison asked. No, Dr. Rem and I replied, placing the sketch back on the table, finally exhaling, his eyes suddenly shifting. My firm knock at the door pulled all four men's attention. Joseph opened the door slightly and listened to something Captain Finnegan had to say. He motioned for Detective Addison to follow him into the hallway. They excused themselves, leaving Mr. Levine to counsel his client as they joined Captain Finnegan and Phil in the hallway. Hey, Phil, I didn't think we would see you today, Detective Addison said, surprised. I had to bring these results by personally, Phil said, opening up a large white envelope. Is he our guy? Captain Finnegan said anxiously. Well, the DNA is a match, Phil started. Yes, we got the bastard, Captain Finnegan said excitedly. Uh, not so fast. It's a 12.5% match to the DNA found on the witness, Phil said, showing the result form to them. What the hell does that mean, Captain Finnegan said annoyed. It means Dr. Remini shares a kinship with the suspect, most likely a first cousin. He isn't our guy, Philip said glumly. Part 18 A cousin? Captain Bennigan asked surprised. Yes, a first cousin, Phil reiterated. Damn, this shit is insane, Detective Addison said, rubbing his head. Is it normal for first cousins to look identical? Joseph asked, looking in at Dr. Remini and Mr. Levine. Uh, usually, if the parents are identical twins, then the first cousins will share just as much DNA as the full siblings and can be identical. It's a little rarer for normal first cousins to look completely alike, but not impossible. Genetics are weird, and I'm not a geneticist, so my knowledge in the area is limited, Phil explained. Wow. Well, Dr. Rem and I should know who our suspect is then. Did you see his reaction to the sketch? Detective Addison asked Captain Finnegan. Yeah, I did. He also seemed reluctant to say anything else. He still might be involved or protecting his family member. Put some pressure on him with those results, Captain Finnegan said slyly. 
Detective Addison took the result from Phil's hands with a thank you as he and Joseph returned back into the interrogation room number three. Mr. Levine and Dr. Remini stopped whispering to each other and looked at him intently. So, detectives, is my client being charged? Mr. Levine asked again. We have the DNA results back. It's a match, Dr. Remini. Detective Addison replied, coolly taking his seat. That's absurd. I didn't murder anyone. Dr. Remini screamed loudly. DNA results don't lie, Dr. Remini, Detective Addison said calmly. Mr. Levine placed his hand on Dr. Remini's shoulder to calm him down once more. Joseph slid the sketch of the suspect back in front of Dr. Remini. He looked down at it again, his face turning the same shade of ghostly white it had when he saw it the first time. Who is this doctor? Joseph asking firmly. No one, Dr. Remini said, pushing the sketch away. No one? It looks like you, and with a DNA match. No probable alibi on the dates of the murders and your job title? Detective Addison turned his attention to Mr. Levine. Is our evidence still circumstantial, Counselor? He asked coldly. I'll need to see those results, please, and thank you. Mr. Levine demanded firmly, holding out his chubby hand for the envelope. Detective Addison handed the envelope to Mr. Levine while maintaining eye contact with Dr. Remini. Dr. Remini refused to meet his eyes and kept his head down, and his hands balled up in his lap. Small droplets of sweat moistened his forehead and neck. His face was still pale and... He looked physically and mentally and emotionally drained. They would have to end the interrogation soon, but they needed some solid answers. Detective Addison slid the sketch back in front of Dr. Remini, who swallowed hard upon seeing it. 12.5%? Ha! You have to be kidding me. It doesn't take a professional to tell you this will never hold up in court, Mr. Levine said loudly, slamming the results on the desk. That's for the DA to figure out. Unless you can give us something else, Dr. Remini, 12.5% makes that suspect a cousin. You know who did this, don't you? Detective Anderson asked firmly, pointing at the sketch. Dr. Remini averted his eyes and looking at the gray wall to his right. Mr. Levine placed his hand firmly on his arm to get his attention. Andreas, they have nothing on you that will stick in court. However, if you have information, you should say something so I can get you the hell out of here, he advised Dr. Remini. Dr. Remini turned to face Detective Addison and Joseph with a dejected look. I had a cousin. He was five years older than me. He was the son of my maternal aunt, my mom's younger sister. Dr. Remini said reluctantly, his eyes watering. Was? Why past tense? asked Joseph. Because my cousin passed away six years ago from suicide. And I'm partially to blame, Dr. Remini said remorsefully. How did he die exactly? Detective Addison asked, leaning forward. He drove his car into Calico Bay. A note was found in his room but his car wasn't found until two years later by some divers. Dr. Remini responded with tears escaping his eyes. Was there a body found in the car? Detective Addison asked anxiously. No. The car windows were down and the car was completely flooded. The divers said no body being present wasn't uncommon. Dr. Remini responded looking defeated, Swiping at the tears on his cheeks, Detective Addison and Joseph looked at each other. Joseph walked over to the table and leaned on it, making eye contact with Dr. Remini. What's your cousin's name? he asked. Samuel Barletta, he replied. And what was Samuel's occupation? Was he a surgeon or doctor as well? 
Detective Addison asked, staring intensely at Dr. Remini. He worked as a veterinarian that specialized in animal surgery, Dr. Remini said, slowly seeming to finally realize something. And you two look identical, Joseph asked, pointing at the sketch. We both took after our maternal grandfather. We looked just like him in his youth. People always mistake Samuel and I as siblings and our grandfather's sons growing up, Dr. Remini said sadly. Did Samuel have any issues with violence that you know of? Detective Addison asked. Samuel and I lived in the same family home for many years. He would copy everything I did. I knew from an early stage I wanted to be a surgeon, like our grandfather and my mother. Samuel decided he wanted to as well. Some of the neighborhood pets started going missing one year. We found a few skinned and buried in the backyard, Dr. Rim and I replied, looking even paler. Did your family do something about it? Detective Addison asked, frowning. We all were instructed to keep quiet, but my aunt put in in therapy. He said he was practicing being a surgeon. He was maybe nine years old, and I was around 14. He was deemed well enough after a few years, and we just went on like nothing happened. As he got older, I excelled in my studies and graduated early. I was accepted into a top medical program. Samuel couldn't cut it and opted for veterinarian school. We had a terrible argument where he accused me of throwing my success in his face and accused the family of preferring me over him. I said some harsh things to him. I told him he needed to accept he would never be as good as me. He went quiet for a couple of months and then we found the note. It destroyed the family. That's why I moved my practice and family to this state, Dr. Remini said woefully. Dr. Remini, is the muscle paralytic rocuronium used in veterinary work? Joseph asked sympathetically. That's not my area of expertise, but I, I believe so. Many of the drugs used for human medical practices are also used in veterinary medicine, Dr. Rem and I responded, looking back at the sketch. The room fell silent as Detective Addison and Joseph digested what they had just learned. Samuel Barletta, a dead man, was their killer. Part 19 Excuse me, gentlemen, Detective Addison said, getting up from the chair. He and Joseph walked back into the hallway where Captain Finnegan and Phil waited. They both looked just as shocked as they felt. Captain Finnegan crossed his arms and paced back and forth a bit looking in at Dr. Remini, who was still teary-eyed and pale, and Mr. Levine, who was trying to comfort him. What do you want to do, Captain? Joseph asked rubbing his hand through his hair. Captain Finnegan stopped pacing and turned to them. We have a name, Samuel Barletta. We know he's somewhere in the city. We have his age now and his description. Let's put out a search. Uh, what about Dr. Remini? Are we cutting him loose? Detective Addison asked. For now, let's have some uniforms. Keep an eye on him, though. Captain Finnegan replied. I highly doubt Samuel Barletta is going by that identity, considering he's supposed to be deceased, Detective Addison said, placing his hands on his hips. More than likely, he's going by a false identity. He's probably working as a veterinarian somewhere as well. How else would we be able to get that amount of rock uranium and flamaldehyde that was found in his hideaway, Joseph added. Even if he managed to take a good enough identity to get a veterinarian job, they would notice that amount of product missing, Phil said calmly. Perhaps he stole it. We can look into recent thefts, Detective Addison started. Uh, I doubt it. More than likely, he purchased the stuff from the black market. With good enough money and the right sites, you can purchase anything on the dark web, Phil interrupted. 
Captain Finnegan noted, We'll check and see if there's been any drug thefts in the surrounding cities, and I'll have computer forensics see what they can find on the dark web. Yeah, all of his shit was destroyed by Mrs. Moore in the fire. If he wants to start again, he'll have to replenish. If he could find his supplier, we could find him, Detective Addison said solemnly. Where is my husband? A sultry voice rang out from around the corner, interrupting their conversation. Captain Finnegan gestured for Detective Addison and Joseph to check it out. They walked down the hall and around the corner briskly where Officer Lena was calmly down a hall, shapely, curly red hair and emerald green eyes. Her fair skin was covered in freckles that adorned both her face and chest. She wore red lipstick that matched her expensive red dress and heels. Holding her hand was a similar version of her, a young girl at around 10 years old. She wore a backpack over her private school uniform. The young girl was nearly identical to the woman, except her curly hair was dirty blonde and her eyes were the same piercing blue Detective Addison and Joseph had just seen in Dr. Rimen eyes. Detective Addison and Joseph walked over to the woman and introduced themselves. The woman introduced herself as Mrs. Mona Remni and her daughter as Ivana. Joseph smiled warmly at Ivana, who blushed and shyly smiled back, revealing braces and dimples. My husband's secretary called me when I was at an event earlier and told me he had been taken and arrested and to call our lawyer. I got here as soon as I can. I, I demand to know what's going on, the woman demanded angrily. Please calm down, Mrs. Remini. We just needed to ask your husband some questions concerning a case we're investigating, Detective Addison replied calmly. Don't tell me to calm down. His secretary said you dragged him away in handcuffs. That doesn't sound like just asking questions, Mona replied angrily. Mrs. Remnai, why don't we go to the conference room and have a talk? Detective Addison said calmly, gesturing down a hallway where the conference room was located. Mrs. Remnai calmed down with a deep breath and shook her head in agreement. Detective Addison asked Officer Lena to sit with Ivana while he and Joseph led Mrs. Remina to the conference room. They all sat at a round table where they explained the case in semi-detailed terms. Mona listened intently, her pale face flushing red at the mention of Samuel Barletta's name. Y you're telling me S Samuel isn't dead? She asked in a quivering voice. We have evidence that suggests he is very much alive and dangerous. Have you noticed anyone lurking around? Have you seen anything unusual? Detective Addison asked. Um, no, no, not that I can recall. Oh, my God. Are we in danger? I mean, he followed us to the state, Mona asked, her face taking on a frightened look. Don't worry, Mrs. Remini. We'll put some police protection at your home for the time being. Do you think your husband or anyone on his side of the family had had any possible contact with Samuel? Detective Addison asked softly. No, of course not. Everyone thinks he died six years ago. Also, Andrea's aunt blames him and herself for his death. She's made that very clear every time. We've seen his family over the years, Mona said, leaning back in her chair. Hmm, I see. Have you come across anything suspicious? I mean anything. Please call us, Detective Addison said, handing Mona his card. Joseph handed her his card as well. They walked her out to the waiting area where Officer Lena was with Lena and told her, to have a seat. She did so with a frightened look still on her face. She attempted to play it off when Ivana noticed. Detective Addison and Joseph walked back to Captain Finnegan and Phil. 
Captain Finnegan was in the middle of releasing Dr. Remini, who was signing some forms, under the careful watch of Mr. Levine. Detective Addison and Joseph walked over to join the conversation with Mr. Levine and Dr. Remini. He was advised not to leave the city and to contact the police department if he came across anything Samuel-related. Dr. Rem and I agreed before being led to the waiting area by a uniformed cop where he was greeted happily by his family. Let's start the search for our suspect, Samuel Barletta, Captain Ferguson said, looking determined. Yes, sir, Detective Addison and Joseph replied simultaneously. Andreas was well aware that the police weren't completely convinced he didn't have anything to do with the crimes. He had been followed back to his villa yesterday evening after his humiliating arrest and ordeal with the police station under the guise of protection. He looked out of his bedroom balcony doors at the unmarked police car stationed across the street as he sipped his coffee. He had decided to take the day off and decompress. Claudia had been instructed to forward an important client and patient calls to a cell. Mona had dropped Ivana off at school and like normal to not alarm her and was headed back home. They had stayed up late speculating and talking about Samuel and the murders and would continue the discussion when she returned. They have even contacted his side of the family and asked if anyone had spoken to him. His parents thought it sounded ridiculous and his aunt rebuffed him and hung up. The whole thing seemed like a bad dream he needed to wake up from. Andrea's cell phone rang and vibrated on the dresser. He walked over and picked it up. The number read private. Hello? Dr. Remini speaking. Andreas answered politely. Hello, cousin. An all too familiar voice replied on the other end causing Andreas to drop his mug and freeze in place. Part 20 Detective Addison walked to the coffee machine where Joseph stood laughing heartily on the phone. His cheeks were flushed, his dimples on full display. When he noticed Detective Addison, he quickly said goodbye and hung up. He poured himself a cup of coffee without making eye contact. Who has you so happy this morning, rookie? Detective Addison asked, smiling teasingly. Oh, um, it's nothing like that. I was just talking to Brianna. I was apologizing for not being able to stay with her at the hospital, Joseph explained, putting two packets of sugar into his coffee. Um, all that smiling and blushing for that conversation, huh? Detective Addison responded, pouring coffee into his mug. Oh, she said something funny. <laughs> She's a funny young woman, Joseph replied, sipping his coffee. Uh-huh, I'm sure. She's also our witness in an active case. Be careful, rookie, Detective Addison replied, sipping his black coffee. Yeah, I know, career suicide, Joseph replied sadly. Detective Addison looked over at Joseph's gloomy expression. Let's solve this case first, rookie, then... She won't be a witness anymore. You get my drift? He said, walking away. Joseph smiled and followed him out of the break room to their desks, where they were met by Maurice from Computer Forensics. Maurice stood about five foot six and was deeply tanned. Her light brown hair hung in a ponytail that reached the middle of her back. She wore thin rimmed rose gold glasses that covered her bright brown eyes. She was narrow but shapely. She held a large computer pad in her manicured hands and smiled at them brightly. And though she looked exhausted with dark black circles under her eyes, there she stood. Hello there, Detective Addison and Detective Ramirez. I found something on your skin and suspect, she said with a deep southern accent. Detective Addison and Joseph took their seats. Great. What did you find? Detective Addison asked. Maurice turned the pad around and tapped on it, bringing up multiple pages of information. She started explaining. 
I looked into Samuel Barletta's sold city and found out that the month before his suicide, multiple cases of formaldehyde were stolen from his old job in a chemical manufacturing plant nearby. I was also able to contact one of his online informants involved in the illegal drug trade side of the dark web and found that a supplier that goes by the handle number one sold some guy in this city six thousand dollars worth of rock uranium just last year three thousand dollars in one transaction and three thousand dollars in a second transaction she said seriously damn i guess both you and phil were right joseph said i was also able to look up who the land the hideaway is on belongs to the owner is a uh, William Golighty. However, the only William Golighty that lived in this city died in 1987, Maurice said, pulling up a death certificate of William Golighty. Well, there's our false identity, Detective Addison said, staring intently at the tablet. I ran William Golighty's name through the system and found he registered a black Infinity Q50 this year and had utilities cut on for a small bungalow in the salon wooded area, she said, smiling. Hot damn, Detective Addison said, jumping up from his chair. Anything else on this, Golighty? Joseph asked, sitting up excitedly. Well, yes, he apparently worked for a year part-time as a veterinary and assistant right outside the city before abruptly quitting. I have the contact information for his old employer right here, Maurice said, scrolling up the tablet. Maurice, damn it, you're good, Detective Addison shouted, causing Maurice to laugh. <laughs> I'm happy you appreciate my efforts. I stayed up late researching all of this. Why, <laughs> I haven't even gone home yet, she replied, smiling weakly. Thank you so much, Joseph said, smiling at Maurice. Maurice, let's go and brief the captain. Rookie, you call Mr. Golighty's old job and get a description. If this is our guy, we possibly know where he lives now. His days of freedom are numbered. Detective Addison said aggressively. He and Maurice walked briskly towards Captain Finnegan's office as Joseph dialed the number to Papa Veterinary Clinic. He introduced himself to a kind male receptionist and briefly explained the information he needed to know. The receptionist was new, but happily placed him on the phone with a veterinary tech named Ashton Clark, who described William as a highly skilled and competent veterinary assistant. However, he was weird and distant. Joseph asked for his physical description and felt an instant feeling of elation. William was described as a young man in his 30s, dirty blonde hair with piercing blue eyes. Andreas' hands started shaking. All he could do was look at the coffee spread in his fluffy cream-colored carpet. How dare you call me? How did you get this number? Andreas demanded in a quivering voice. Oh, is that any way to greet family after six years? You should be happy to hear from me, Andreas. Happy? I know what you've been doing, you sick bastard. The police are looking for you as we speak. Andreas yelled angrily. <laughs> you make human art and I make human art, cousin. Or do you still think you're better than me? What you're doing is murder. Don't compare yourself to me ever. We're nothing alike, Andreas replied angrily, his hands shaking violently. You're still as pompous as ever, Andreas. It doesn't matter anymore. You're going to help me get what I need. <laughs> help you? You're crazier than I thought. I'm calling the police, Andrea said, hanging up. With shaking hands, he gripped his phone tightly and prepared to dial 911 until he realized the cop across the street was quicker. He ran to his balcony doors when his phone dinged. He looked down to see that a message was sent by the private number. He nervously opened it, and his stomach dropped. 
His mouth went dry as he fell to his knees. On his phone was a photo of an unconscious Mona lying motionless on a surgical table in a dimly lit room. His phone rang again, the caller ID reading, private, once more. He questioned it, grabbing a handful of carpet with his freed hand. I see you got the photo. If you contact the police, I'll make you a single parent. Understand? Why are you doing this, Samuel? Andreas asked desperately. Don't call me that. Samuel died six years ago. He was a loser who couldn't live out his dreams, remember? I'm living out my dreams now, cousin. Please don't hurt Mona. She's never done anything to you. She was always kind to you, Andreas pleaded. Don't worry. She's not my type. Too frickly. Her skin isn't perfect enough for me. She's not what I need, Andreas. You're going to help me get what I need. What is it you need? Andreas asked desperately, tears rolling down his face. I want you to bring the bitch that got away. Part 21 Joseph hung up the phone with a thank you after writing down the information Ashton Clark provided about William Golighty. He also used the car registration information to pull up a temporary license that was issued to Mr. Golighty. William Golighty and Samuel Barletta were definitely one and the same. He quickly jumped from his chair and hurried to Captain Finnegan's office, where Detective Addison and Marcy were just finishing giving him a rundown of the information she found on Samuel Barletta's, a.k.a. William Golighty's, doings. Joseph knocked on the door with his knuckles and was waved in by Captain Finnegan, who was leaning on his desk. His arms crossed as he listened intently to Marcy and Detective Addison. Detective Ramirez... What did you find on Mr. Golighty? Captain Finnegan asked. Here's a copy of his temporary license. I also got his description from his old workplace. William Golighty is Samuel Barletta, Joseph said contently. Okay, I'll get on the phone with Judge Tanner and get the warrants. Get ready. We'll probably have to do this by ambush. This bastard is dangerous. Captain Finnegan griped as he walked around his desk. Yes, sir. We all briefed the others, Detective Addison replied. Detective Addison, Joseph, and Maurice exited Captain Finnegan's office as he dialed. Judge Tanner. They sent out a few cops dressed as civilians to covertly look around the Selene Woods area with Samuel Barletta's description and instructions not to engage. They wanted eyes on him, if possible. They gathered their fellow officers around the precinct and gave them the information on Samuel Barletta, a.k.a. William Golighty. Once the warrants arrived, they would have to move very quickly with precision. Samuel Barletta was unstable and would have to be dealt with with precaution. I want you to bring me that bitch that got away. Are, are you referring to the hospitalized victim? Andreas asked, trying to control his quivering voice. Yes, Brianna Moore. Bring her to me. Once I have her, you can have this freckled-faced bitch back with her skin still on. I mean, it's not possible. She's more than likely under police protection, and she's in the hospital. Andreas screamed into the phone. St. Mary's is where you did two years of your residency. You also did your pretentious seminars there once a year, cousin. Make it happen. That doesn't mean I can just waltz in there and remove an injured patient. How does that make any sense? Andreas replied. Figure it out. 
You're supposed to be so smart, Andreas. Andreas the smart A student. Andreas the full ride scholarship. Pride of the family. I'm sure you'll find a way. Samuel, please be responsible, Andreas cried desperately. I said, don't call me that. I'm, look, I'm sorry, please. How do you expect me to do this? We look alike. How would I even be able to approach her? Have you thought about any of this? Andrea cries bitterly. <laughs> Listening to you cry pathetically is cathartic, Andreas. You're not so high and mighty now, are you? I found out that they will be moving her to a regular floor tomorrow. There will be less monitoring there. There's your opportunity. Tomorrow. Andrea said, pulling himself up off the floor. He looked out the window at the police across the street who was sipping water. He wanted badly to go get his attention, to motion towards his phone. He wanted badly to get help, but his thoughts went back to the photo of a motionless Mona. Where was she? Samuel had skinned three other alive and attempted to do so with the young woman he was demanding to be brought to him. He was always jealous of Andreas, and by default hated everything Andreas had, including his wife. Samuel would kill her. Furthermore, he didn't know where Samuel was. He would be watching him as they spoke on the phone. Samuel knew that he had been given yearly seminars at St. Mary's. Samuel had victims in the city he had moved to with his family and where he opened his practice. Samuel had always been watching. That thought infuriated Andreas, causing goosebumps to cover his entire body. Andreas, do you understand? Yes, I understand. I'll go to St. Mary's tomorrow, Andreas said begrudgingly. Wonderful. Oh, and, uh, Andreas, if you try and get the police involved, I'll pill her like an orange. Captain Finnegan exited his office after an hour with a smile across his pale face. He had documents in his hand as he made his very hastily to Detective Addison and Joseph's desks. Judge Tanner issued the warrants. We're good to go, fellas. Let's go and get this son of a bitch. Part 22 They waited for the cover of night to make their move. The wind blew fiercely through the tall trees making rustly sounds. The moon stood boldly and full in the night sky, lending just enough light to them as they slowly approached the Salem Woods neighborhood. The undercover cops kept a careful watch throughout the day, and the Black Infinity Q-50 had not left the parking space of the small house, nor had any person left or returned to the house. Detective Addison, Joseph, and Captain Finnegan were suited up in their bulletproof vests. The uniformed cops wore tactical gear. They quietly approached the car and peeked inside. There was nothing they could see that was alarming, so they approached the small house nestled between the trees. Its porch lights shone brightly. The soft glow of other houses' lights were visible through the trees. Captain Finnegan slightly gave hand signals, and a few cops quietly positioned themselves around the perimeter of the small house, hopefully preventing any attempted escapes. Beads of sweat formed on, Joseph's forehead as he held his gun steadily in his hands. Detective Addison stood on the left side of the front door and he on the right. They looked at one another and then Captain Finnegan, who shook his head and waved his hand to a officer who quickly slammed the door with a battering ram near the lock. 
The sound pierced through the night with a shriek. The door swung open violently as they flooded the small house, guns drawn. They were met with a horrific stench, a smell that was familiar to most of them. It was the smell of decomposition. Detective Addison, Joseph, and Captain Finnegan looked around carefully. There was nothing unusual in the living room. They moved as a well-organized group through a swinging door that led to the kitchen. There, the stench was even stronger. On the kitchen counter were gloves and a scalpel covered in dried blood. They checked the kitchen pantry. It was spacious, but it only contained a few dry food items and an open 24-pack of bottled water. They moved cautiously to the bathroom where the stench was overwhelming. To their horror, they found the source. Inside, hanging up on a line that was tied to the shower head and pinned to the wall on the other side were the skins of multiple small animals. Inside the bathtub was the skinless corpses of the animals in the early stages of decomposition. Inside the porcelain sink were two empty bottles of formaldehyde. Joseph had to leave quickly before he vomited everywhere as the smell was potent and his stomach was beginning to turn. They all left the bathroom in silence and moved down the hall to the bedroom where the door was closed. Detective Addison opened it cautiously. They stepped into a minimalist bachelor bedroom with a full-length mirror pushed against the wall. The dressers between were open and empty. On top was a mostly used roll of fine mesh gauze and a half tube of silver sulfidine. They dropped their guns to their sides in disappointment. Captain Finnegan grit his teeth in frustration. Detective Addison furled his brow as he noticed an empty bottle of rock uranium in the top dresser drawer. Joseph felt an overwhelming feeling of hopelessness. Samuel Barletta was gone. Andreas looked in the mirror of his in Mona's luxury dresser. His eyes were puffy from crying and he felt lightheaded. He hadn't eaten anything all day. He couldn't. He had asked his parents of Ivana's close friend Chloe to keep her for the weekend as he and Mona were experiencing a family crisis. He asked that they didn't mention anything to Ivana. Ivana was happy for her impromptu sleepover. He had just hung up from her. He told her to behave well and that he loved her dearly. She asked to speak to her mother. He was forced to lie. Mona often suffered from migraines. He told her she had had another migraine attack and had taken her medicine and gone to bed early, but that she loved her very, very much. He broke down after hanging up. A deep hatred brewed within his chest, a mixture of anger, betrayal, and disgust that he had never encountered before. He always knew Samuel disliked him, that he was jealous of him. However, he never would have imagined he'd go this far. Andreas looked at his and Mona's wedding photo that hung up on the wall opposite their bed. It was large and Mona looked ravishing. They had been together for so long. Mona had stuck by him through every hardship, even when his family became distant and cold after Samuel's faux suicide. She always understood him, no matter what. He walked over to the photo and rubbed it gently, a tear escaping his eye. Tomorrow, he said quietly. The rocky ronium had worn off enough for Mona to just barely open her eyes. Her body was still paralyzed. She listened to Samuel hum a lullaby, both his mom and aunt sang to him, and Andreas, when they were children. He turned around and noticed her eyes. Oh, it's almost time for another injection, I see. Don't want to give you too much. I can't have you stop breathing. <laughs> At least not yet. Tears rolled down her face as she thought about Andreas and Ivana. She was on her way back from dropping Ivana off at school. 
She stopped to get herself a smoothie and her and Andreas their favorite bagels from one of their favorite mom-and-pop breakfast cafes. When she returned to her car, Samuel was in the back seat. He threatened her with a scalpel to the neck. If she tried anything, she knew he was unstable and would keep his promise to kill her and send her skin to Andreas and Ivana. That's what he told her he would do. He looked deranged as he said it. His eyes were wild. The skin on the left side of his neck and face were red and peeling. His left arm was wrapped in gauze. His right one had remained steady as he pressed the scalpel to her neck. He even nicked her with it slightly so she would understand he meant business. He had forced her to give him her phone, which he cut off. He told her where to drive, and then he stuck her in the neck with a needle, and her body became a prison. Everything happened quickly and slowly at the same time. Samuel turned back around and unwrapped his left arm. It was blistered and red. He screamed out in pain. His hand shook as he slathered burn ointment all over it and his chest. He rewrapped his wounds with clean gauze, cursing loudly. He breathed in and out heavily before swinging back around to face Mona. You see? You see what you did to me? Once Andreas brings me Brianna, all of this will be over, Mona. I promise. Part 23 Samuel was elated. The morning had arrived, bringing with it a fresh storm. Heavy rain poured outside, and the sky was under a gray and cloudy tent. Good things happened when it rained. It was always the perfect and natural cover. Most couldn't stand to be soaked and quickly ran through it or stayed out of it. But for Samuel, it was the perfect hunting time. Hopefully, it was the perfect distraction for Andreas to bring him Brianna Moore. He turned around and looked at Mona, who was fully paralyzed. He checked her pulse. It was weak, but still there. He would call Andreas in a bit for an update. If he had succeeded, which he better had, he would give him directions to his location and he'll finally have what he so desperately needed. Andreas felt an incredible amount of guilt, frustration, and sickness, and anger all balled up into one in the pit of his stomach. He sat in his car, his hands tightly around the steering wheel, while looking out in the ever-increasing amount of rain. The coily, red-haired young woman breathed steadily in his passenger seat. He couldn't even look at her as he waited for Samuel's call. Finally, after what felt like ages, his phone rang, reading private. He answered it monotonously. Do you have her? Yes, but before I bring her to you, I need confirmation that Mona's still alive, Andreas yelled angrily. Samuel laughed maniacally for a few seconds before Andreas' phone vibrated. He had received a short video. He watched it with Samuel still on the phone. It was Mona lying on the same table, breathing slowly and shallow. He couldn't stop the tears from flowing when he saw his wife still alive, though clearly in need of medical care. Is that good enough? Yes, Andreas replied. Wonderful. Bring her to the old cereal warehouse on Watkins and Langley. Andreas... If you deceive me, I'll slit her throat. I understand, Andreas replied, gripping his steering wheel tighter, causing his hands to hurt. Andreas drove as quickly as possible through the rain and late morning traffic. The thunder roared in the sky like tribal drums that mimicked the beating of his heart. The warehouse had been closed less than a year due to an electrical fire that destroyed most of the left side. It was about 35 minutes from Andrea's current location, but due to the rain, it would take him longer. He drove with caution, yet urgency. 
He didn't want to wreck, but he needed to get there as quickly as possible. Samuel laughed loudly, waking Mona, who still couldn't move. It was becoming harder for her to breathe. Samuel had allowed the rocuranium to wear off occasionally to not cause her respiratory failure. However, it still felt as if she was slowly suffocating. Samuel spun around briskly, walking towards her. He lifted her right eyelid. Mona, Mona, your husband is bringing what is mine. Today is going to be a glorious day. Andreas pulled into the huge empty parking lot of a half-burnt warehouse. He was instructed to pull around the back. His heart jumped as he spotted Mona's white car pulled discreetly close to the building. He parked closer to it and grabbed a black poncho from his back seat. He quickly exited, running around to the passenger seat where he covered the young woman when the poncho and lifted her into his arms. Her bandage left arm dangled freely. Samuel had called again and instructed Andreas to bring her to the third floor. Andreas entered into an unlocked side door that led down a short hallway and a stairwell that was dimly lit by a few on the wall battery operated lights. He started his ascension with sweat dripping down his back, legs, and forehead. He could barely hear the roar of thunder outside, but could only hear the sound of his own rapid heart beating. Samuel heard Andrea's heavy approaching footsteps and limped towards Mona. He placed a scalpel to her neck and stared at the double doors in anticipation. For a moment, he forgot about the pain of the burns on his body as he instructed Andreas to kick the doors open. It swung open and his cousin entered. Andreas was soaked from the rain but otherwise still looked like a slightly older version of himself. In his arms, covered in large black poncho with that beautiful, coily hair sticking out, was his prize. Welcome, Andreas. Long time no see. At least for you. Bring her over here, Samuel said, motioning to a second operation table. Andreas walked slowly over to the second table, never taking his eyes off of Samuel or Mona. Samuel held a scalpel to Mona's neck. His expression looked unhinged, even in the dim light, offered by the battery-powered, operated lights that adorned the walls and the overcast lights that filtered through the filthy warehouse windows. Andreas laid the young woman on the table gently and turned around, facing his cousin. Give me my wife, he demanded. Samuel licked his lips, looking at the young woman on the table. His eyes narrowed as he frowned. Uncover her, he demanded, lifting his right hand a bit from Mona's neck. Andreas slowly peeled away the poncho when suddenly the young woman sprang up, Gun drawn, revealing herself to be Detective Ash Bancole, a second generation West African young woman of familiar stature and appearance to Brianna Moore. Samuel's eyes widened as the room was suddenly flooded with police led by Captain Finnegan, Detective Addison, and Joseph. Drop the scalpel, Barletta, Captain Finnegan demanded sternly. No, no, no. Where is Brianna? Samuel demanded, tears rolling down his face as he lowered the scalpel to Mona's throat. Don't do it, Berlotta. The whole building is surrounded. There's no way out of this, Detective Addison yelled. I don't care if I die. I'll take this bitch with me if you don't bring me Brianna. Samuel, stop this, please, Andreas pleaded. <laughs> I told you not to call me that. Why? Why is it that you only get what you want, huh? Why? Samuel demanded, crying harder. What I want is for us to be cousins again, 
for us not to compete for once. Just be family, okay? Andreas replied, tears rolling down his cheeks. Liar. You are such a liar, Andreas. You never cared about me. <laughs> you did everything to show me up. Even now, you deceived me. You can never let me have anything. <laughs> you took everything I've ever wanted. You even deprived me of what I need. <laughs> Samuel cried. Drop the scalpel, Barletta. Captain Finnegan demanded again. Samuel laughed madly as tears poured from his eyes. He looked down at Mona and smiled widely. Part 24 Earlier that morning, Captain Finnegan paced angrily backwards and forwards as Detective Addison and Joseph stared aimlessly at the digital crime board. Last night was a bust. Samuel Barletta was gone, and according to Phil, from the decomposition of the animal corpses found at his home, he had been gone from there a couple of days. They had no way of knowing where he was or where he went. Damn it! We might have to go ahead and leak this to the media. That annoying reporter, Roberta Asher, from Channel 7 News, has been calling me nonstop about this case. Captain Finnegan said, exasperated. Oh, if we do that, we'll have to prepare for hundreds, even thousands of nonsense calls, Detective Addison said, placing his hands on his hips and leaned his head back. Any movement on Dr. Remini? Captain Ferguson asked. No, sir. According to Officer Allen, he didn't leave the house. Joseph replied, sitting at his desk. Joseph's phone rang and he answered it. He quickly jumped up from his chair and placed the phone on speaker. It was Officer Allen and Dr. Remini. Dr. Remini had left his house early in the morning and motioned for Officer Allen to follow him. They drove all the way to St. Mary's Hospital where Dr. Remini revealed that his wife Mona was being held hostage by Samuel, who was demanding that Brianna Moore be brought to him or he would kill her. This is our opportunity, fellas, Captain Finnegan yelled. We're going to need someone to act as a decoy for Barletta, Detective Addison added, checking his gun. Uh, what about Detective Ash Benkel from the special unit victim? I noticed her and Brianna kind of favor, Joseph said sheepishly. Both Captain Finnegan and Detective Addison smiled at Joseph. They called in Detective Benkel and briefed her along with the other policemen. They formulated their tactical plan carefully but quickly as Mr. Remini's life was on the line and catching Samuel Barletta was their top priority. Drop the scalpel, Barletta, Captain Finnegan demanded again. Samuel laughed madly as tears poured from his eyes. He looked down at Mona and smiled widely. If I can't have what I want, neither can you, he screamed, pressing down the scalpel, slicing Mona's neck. Just then, Joseph let out a shot, hitting Samuel's right wrist, ripping through it. He let out a horrific scream, but surprisingly didn't realize the scalpel. He raised it up, taking a run towards Andreas, and was met with a barrage of bullets. The sound was piercing as they hit him in the chest and arms. Samuel stopped, blood pouring from his body, tears from his eyes. He fell to his knees and backwards onto his back, his lungs filled with blood and bodily fluids, causing his breath to rattle. Mona? Samuel? Detective Addison ran over to Samuel and kicked away the scalpel. He screamed from the medics who rushed with their equipment in hand. 
Some went to Mona and some went to Samuel, who lay bleeding out on the dirty warehouse floor. Every breath Samuel took was labored as the medics worked to sustain him. Andreas walked slowly over to Samuel and fell on his knees beside him. The medics asked him to move, but he reassured them he was a doctor. He helped apply pressure to one of the chest wounds and bent down, whispering something in his ear. A single tear escaped Samuel's left eye before his labored breathing stopped. His eyes dilated. Mandy was gone. Resuscitation was a failure, and they pronounced Samuel dead. Andreas got up and ran to his wife. Her neck was cut badly, but not on the important artery. Her breathing was shallow as the raconium was paralyzing her lungs. The medics wrapped her neck and provided her with some oxygen before carrying her out of the warehouse. Andreas stayed by her side, speaking to her, telling her how much he and Ivana loved her. Mona's ears were ringing from the shots fired. She didn't know if she had been hit or not, as she couldn't move or even open her eyes. However, hearing the police arrive and the comforting voice of Andreas let her know everything would be okay. She would fight to live. She would feel the oxygen enter her body through the non-rebreather mask on her mouth. Her neck stung badly, and she still couldn't move a muscle, but she would survive for Andreas, Ivana, and herself. The warehouse became even more chaotic as the crime scene was secured by investigation officers. Captain Finnegan, Detective Addison, and Joseph all gave their statements. Their guns were taken as customary after an officer involved shooting. The body cameras and guns of the other officers were also confiscated. Detective Addison and Joseph walked outside and stood by their cars, leaving Captain Finnegan inside the warehouse to speak with the investigation officers. Detective Addison lit a cigarette and took a long drag. The rain had finally stopped, and the sun was just peeking out from behind the clearing gray clouds. You did good in there, rookie. I'm proud of you, Detective Addison said, looking at Joseph. Thank you, sir. You too. I'm just glad we can close this case finally, he replied, looking up at the sky. Yep, now we just got a shit ton of paperwork and the mandatory counseling bullshit to get through. Once that's over, you're free to pursue Miss Moore, Detective Addison said teasingly. What? Where did that come from? Joseph replied, his cheeks turning red. Uh-huh, rookie. Part 25 The precinct was buzzing with excitement as Officer Lena walked in. She felt strange as everyone stared at her briefly and looked away. She wanted to ask what was going on, but didn't bother and walked towards the break room just to be stopped by Detective Addison. Suddenly, they both were surrounded as he took a knee, opening a small velvet red box that contained a gorgeous diamond ring. Oh my God, Carlson, what is this? Lena asked, tearing up. You know I'm terrible with this romantic bullshit, but I wanted to do this before our fellow friends and officers. Officer Lena Danielle Fairchild, will you marry me? Detective Addison asked. The entire precinct erupted into cheers and claps. Yes, yes, I'll marry you, Lena said happily. Detective Addison awkwardly stood up and placed the ring on Lena. He kissed and hugged her under the roars and applauses by their fellow officers. Joseph congratulated them and hugged them both warmly. Captain Finnegan announced there was a celebration cake in the break room. The festivities couldn't last too long, however, as crime never rests, and they all had to return back to their duties, though a bit happier. Joseph grabbed his jacket from his chair. He had one more counseling session before the skinning shooting that happened a month ago. He walked down the hallway and was met by Brianna, who was looking all well and beautiful, in an overall blue jean dress over a cream-colored turtleneck and cream tights. She had a stylish blue walking cane in her right hand. 
Her beautiful hair fell loosely around her face and shoulders, and her lips had a shimmer to them. Joseph couldn't help but blush. Hey, Brianna, what are you doing here? Is everything okay? He asked. Yeah, I'm on my way to physical therapy and wanted to drop by and see you, she said shyly, her cheeks turning rosy. Oh, I'm on my way out too. Let's walk out together, Joseph said. They walked down the hall together in silence for a few awkward moments. I wanted to thank you, Joseph, for everything you did for me last month. You made me feel safe when my family wasn't there, Brianna said softly. Yeah, no problem. It's my job, Joseph replied, smiling at her. Yeah, but you went above and beyond. I was wondering if maybe, um, if I could treat you to dinner, you know, to thank you and stuff. Brianna asked awkwardly, squinching her face up in embarrassment. Uh, yeah, I would like that. I would like that a lot, Joseph replied softly. He and Brianna stopped just short of the exit and made eye contact. They both smiled at each other warmly. I don't understand why you're doing this, Mona asked, irritated, as she pulled into the cemetery parking lot. He was still family, Mona. I'll be back. Stay here with Ivana, Andrea said, grabbing a bouquet of flowers and exiting the car. Andreas walked through the peaceful cemetery, his long black coat blowing in the wind. He had paid for Samuel's burial and had even flown out his aunt and parents for his private funeral. They had to fight off reporters for the last month, both in his current city and his family in this old one. Samuel's faux death destroyed the family the first time, but Samuel's real death brought them back together. His aunt apologized to him wholeheartedly with tears when learning about Samuel's fake suicide and murders. The whole family would be flying out for the holidays. Andreas was happy that Ivana would finally experience the closeness of family he had wished for. Andreas stopped at Samuel's grave and looked at his black headstone. He laid the flowers on the grave and knelt down. You know, Samuel, I meant what I said that morning in the warehouse. You were always so fucking stupid, and you never were as good as me. I also have the same urges. That's why I became a surgeon. There is nothing like the feel of slicing through skin. If you had half a brain cell, you could have fulfilled your needs a legal way. You got what you deserved, Andrea said. Standing up, he smiled widely, the wind blowing through his dirty blonde hair, his piercing blue eyes staring at Samuel's name on the headstone before he walked away. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to Skin, a 25-part story. Before I close out this video, I would like to give a very special shout-out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Thank you all so much for remaining the pillars of which Back to Ashes stands upon. You know my gratitude and you all know my heart. Thank you all so, so, so much. To the rest of the subscribers, to the newbies, or for anyone just kind of peeking in to check out the scenery, stories, yada, yada. <laughs> Thank you so much for your continued support. For without you... I would not have a voice and there would not be a back to ashes. I cannot thank you all enough. If you are asleep, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I really, truly hope you've enjoyed this story. Until next time, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night.
Peace, love, and light to you all.